reception of guests. Welcome, Katie. Matthew, how are you? Um, any uh, revisions to the agenda? Can I just give some warnings, Chris? Sure. Um, I handed you three sheets of paper. Two of them are budget related. Um, I have done this budget presentation now three times, once at U32, once at Berlin, and once at Doty. And I did it under rapid fire last night at Doty, because I had to get to my daughter's um, concert up at People's, and that took an hour just to do it really fast, and I think I bowled people over. So it's been taking a good hour and a half discussion on the budget okay. at every school. Because of looking at it individual and merged, and the, I gave you some new ways of looking at it with one sheet there so you can understand and comprehend that. Tim, uh, one, even prior to hearing that, uh, I was hoping to, to perhaps reorder some of the agenda items just based on uh, the immediacy of, of the issues. So for example, putting Act 46 discussion I'll say, Act 46? I brought brownies. <laughs> <laughs> um, Love you guys. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you. you. I was wondering which one you were at when I saw you and Kim and... <laughs> I'm in this one. We had too many brownies. There's enough for everybody. <laughs> Sounds like a better me. So, Brian, please do. Yeah. 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 Just moving it up to, like, 3.3. Moving it under the budget draft. So it's... Because I feel that's, that's something we have, we have to yep. discuss. And I have a bunch of questions that I need advice on that as well. So thank okay. you, Brian. Any other proposals in terms of uh, reordering, reordering our uh, line of business? Um, I, well, I had sent out a piece on the district management group, and I, um, I'm happy to talk about it or not. I would like it to go to the minutes, but um, to, is it something people want to have a brief conversation about or not particularly? Okay. Uh, so I mean, I, no, I think she's asking. Just it's a question. Similar. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say the same. I think they're saying the same thing. You go. Oh, okay. Let's see what time provides. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I would propose that we start with the budget um, because I just suspect it's going to be a budget and goals discussion. I think we need to do both. Yeah, I think you're um, in the right place, Chris. So um, we'll open it up for. Let me give a little context and because I'm going to be asking the question. Was there any objection to switching the order so we do the budget first? No, I like that. Okay. okay. Um, and for. Uh, Matthew, you saw these last night, so I don't know if you need them again. And Katie, if you want copies, you're more than welcome. I'm bringing plenty of them with me these days. There's two sheets. There's that one that I just placed on, and this one right here. Okay, and here comes David, so I'll put one out for David as well. Um, thanks. Hand that right to David. Um, so. I handed you three sheets. The first one we can save for Act 36, which is the timeline. I handed you a sheet that's like this that you've seen other years. It's our current year budget sorted across all six schools by functions in the budget. And with the yellow being low and the green being high. And it's not necessarily good that you're low or good that you're high or bad if you're low or bad if you're high. This is a tool to ask questions. And I would remind the board, every year I seem to forget to do this, but that the Rumney is in this section from where it's in the column that goes over, the, that Rumney's over. Then you have the percentages for your percentage of the budget. And the next one right before the U32 column titled is the cost per equalized pupil. I don't give this to drive you to make it equal across all schools. I give this so you can ask better questions. Because I believe in having data allows you to ask better questions. It usually doesn't give you the answer necessarily. Okay, uh, so they'll just to clear clarify, the Romney column begins. Uh, the, Romney the first data. one is one thousand to twenty. Yeah. So the instructional services cost one million two hundred twenty thousand two hundred twenty. I'm sorry. Yeah. One million. Okay. okay. But that's the seven thousand is not attached to us. That is. You know that is that. that is so thirty seven. Oh, okay. That's thirty percent. Seven percent of your budget goes to instructional services, or the cost per equalized pupil that you're spending on instructional services is seven thousand six hundred and twenty six. Okay. No, that's right. But the, the seven thousand four hundred and forty three oh. belongs to East Montpelier. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And so what this also tells you up above is gives you some demographic data. So in the enrollment as of 10-1, so it's a pre-K-12 
uh, it's a pre-K-12, so pre-K-6 for here. You get your average daily membership, your equalized pupils. And the reason I'm going to stress equalized pupils in everything we talk about tonight is that's how you get to tax rates. And that's how you get to limits on spending. Okay? There's also some square footage, number of meals per day, free and reduced lunch, sped, and enrollment of pre-K students. You'll see that you had a total, this year's current year, your total budget is 3266283 which equates to a cost per equalized pupil of 20413 Do people see those numbers? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to skip all the way down to the bottom. I'll let you have a minute or two to read this and ask me any clarifying questions or other questions as well. Down at the bottom, what's below is other fiscal information that's devised by a different divisor, divided by a different divisor. So operational plant, we actually look at the cost per square foot because the cost for running the building is not going to really change by the number of kids. Um, then you see it with capital fund and debt. You see your support for food service per meal per day. So you can see what different communities are putting that. And then you see your cost of special education per sped student enrollment. So is the high enroll in relation to other schools in the district? Yes, it's all within the district. So I don't have this, Chris. I, that's one of the things the new, the law that's pushing us to a common fiscal system across the state mm -hmm. is start to look at this across the state and then student transportation i'm not sure how much that's really even relevant to look at there it's one we've held um, but it's just by per equalized pupil it's relatively equalized because the range isn't that great it only goes from 673 to 694 so i, I think we're actually you know that, and that's one of the things you have to look at when you see the yellows and the greens. The range may not be that great, or it may be a small amount per equalized pupil. So it's like, is this really a place to ask a question about? So once again, I, I give you this as a chart to think about questions you may want to ask about the budget, not so much to give you answers to places to cut or add. It's just a way of, of kind of looking at what your current Are you, is. is that something that we're supposed to, you'd like us to do now or is this for reference this for reference later okay. it's for reference for further discussions we need to have i know that i'm giving it last year we gave this in november and we didn't get it here till december this year can i ask you for romney um i think the um you know i i wonder about the, you know, if you look at the special education local, it's really high per equalized student. And then you can look down at what's the cost per sped student overall. You're not the highest, but you're, you're above some of our lower districts. And what's so that the difference? does not include, for example, a student that we're paying tuition for. It does. Place. It does, okay. Yeah. Does it take into account kids whose there's revenue that comes back. Yeah, this is only expenditure. This is only expenditure. Okay. Can you explain, just rem remind me what the difference then is between local and total? It's local because you're, you're, you, I'd want to go look at that. I can answer that question right now. Though, really. Um, I think I believe, yep, yep, that includes both the SU assessment, no it doesn't, hold on, that 236 it are your local costs right here at Rumney that Rumney pays direct, so it's your paraeducators. Where's 236? Where am I? If I look oh, right, at the, the right 236, account, 115? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. that's your cost here, it doesn't include your cost of what you're paying for your SU assessments for your special education teachers and outside costs. And when I go down... So consultants would be an example of uh, Paid through the SU. Yeah. 
What about, um, we talked last meeting, it was, uh, the, the nurse talked about uh, contracting with, I don't know if it's Washington County Mental Health, but having- So um, those all run through, if there's someone has a behavior intervention mm -hmm. through Washington County Mental Health or Green Mountain Associates, that's all paid through the SU, SU. Okay. assessment for special education. Who's and the two days a week there, as she said, they bill separate. Like okay. They just have the space, space. and come. Okay. We don't pay for okay. that. Okay, so that's taken up by mm -hmm. private insurance or Medicare or yep. something. Okay. So does the two thirty six include Washington County? Services no, those those services? no those are at those are come through the SU assessment. But it does. I heard you say include the tuition that we're paying to the So not the two thirty six. The down below the special uh, education costs per kid okay. on top of the actual cost. I thought uh, though we were focusing on the uh, equalized pupil, which looks like it's actually. Pretty close to what the other schools, Doty and East Montpelier, have in terms of being in that like 900. Well, it's a it, you know. It, Isn't that where you're? Interested? When I look at I look at the Katie, when I look at numbers usually for data, I look for order or magnitude difference. So from seven, it's not that huge of a difference overall in, in amount per equalized pupil, but it if if I just go over to Romney uh, to Middles to East Montpelier, which is right next to it. It's 970 and it's 923 at U32. So 1400, the difference is about from 900 to 1400 is about $500, which is almost 50% magnitude dip change. Right. I guess when I look at it though, isn't it that the Romney data is 970 per student? And if you look at East. No, 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 no. You're it's, one over. You're one it's over. It's not Katie. the connected. Oh. It's the one in green. <laughs> yeah. 1,476. Oh. oh, that actually is. So you're 50% greater. Okay. That's in cost. Cool. So that, that's how I usually like to look at this number is the relative magnitude. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's why I was apologizing at the beginning, Katie, that I, I need to put some really dark vertical bars on this. Yeah, okay, now I, now I understand. So what I, that's, and that's, I think what you were asking me what to look for, it's that relative magnitude is the big thing. And if it, if it, the relative magnitude isn't that much difference, then okay, let's not ask questions about that. Do we have any data for after the um, revenue comes back, what those numbers would be? So I'm thinking about kids who part of their special education costs are covered. Some kids 100% is covered. Right, so we charge from the SU, you could only charge the net cost. So that line down below is the net so cost. Revenue is already taken out. So that's the it's okay. a net so special. Yeah. Of but remember, it's equalized across, it's, it's distributed by assessment by equalized pupils across mm -hmm. the whole supervisory union yep. for this year because you voted okay, to do so. that. Yep. So then, then that's not necessarily not not up services here. that are provided. It's just our responsibility. Down here is your res is your responsibility. Up here is what you're doing locally. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, you're saying the other. Um, and I have to go. I don't know why it's not more equalized, Chris. I want to go ask Lori that. I I haven't talked about that the way you guys are, the way you're asking questions, you're the first board to kind of ask me those differentials. So I want to say, because I would think down below under student transportation, under student special education costs per SPED student, that that would be relatively the same. But what Lori might be doing there is adding in the net cost from the SU plus the total cost at the local and getting that. But I want to go ask her that and get clarification on it for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. What does it mean if uh, I'm just trying to to understand what um, sort of the root of what we're we're getting at with yeah. with this question? Well, it's it's what you have to look at is um, I think you know one of the things you you want to you want to look at this to say where are we different than others, and it's okay to be different. It's there's nothing wrong with being different. I mean, one. I'm sorry. I just I mean in regards to special education, uh, I um, I kind of got lost from where Caroline was asking a question. And, yeah. And all the way. Woden asked me, "What would you have us look at?" Yeah. And I'd have you look at the greens and then look at the relative size in the discussion. I would I've gotten much tighter to answer her question and talking it out. 
I'd have you look at the relative size across the schools. And if there's a, you know, if there's a big variance, you might ask, if low or high, are we not providing something we should be providing? You know, I'd look at the percentages. If you look at instructional services, they range anywhere from 35% to 41% of the budget goes into instructional services. I think almost every year I've made a case that one of my goals is to put more fiscal cert more fiscal resources into instructional services. Now, I also include special education in that and others, so I'd have to total that up. Um, What's interest expense? We, it just happens to be a green, that's why. Right, so what, that's a hard one to really look at because you pay for your, the money that, you're, that you take in lieu of taxes along with and you have an expense to do that, you also have a revenue that offsets that on the other side. Okay. So <clears throat> this is just looking at an expenditure budget. It's not looking at revenues. Okay. The interest expense in time related to the bond? Um, or is it? I'd want to go check that, but I think that's all in the cat, all in no. the, uh, op in the debt service, I believe, Chris. Okay. But I'd want to go check that. And why is our health so high? Have you thought about that? Health services, yes, you have much greater nursing services than other buildings for people. Okay, and are, is there a uh, student, like I know sometimes there are students who are diabetic and that, that's a, is a life, is a, you know, life and death type issue, is that? I can't speak to that because of people privacy. So you can't speak to whether or not we have? The problem is you get, you start to get right down to what, it's pretty obvious in this community people know who the kids are that have certain health needs. Okay. So we'd be exposing I guess things. the question perhaps is, you know, is this because of certain health needs that require a higher level of nursing, or do you think we have more nursing than we need? Is it a necessary expense at the level it is now? It's a necessary expense right now. Okay. And probably we'll may not. I, you don't know what's will happen if people need Okay. So can I move you? We can yeah. sit and study this all yeah. night. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. The next piece is actually the one I'm, that just came on Monday. Uh, I'm sorry, this one did not get in your packet. This one you did have in your packet, but you had the eight and eleven, eight and a half, and eleven that you needed a microscope for. Yeah. So this next one is a little bit more complicated. It's new. What I did was take information off of this current fiscal year, the budget, the final budget by function. And I brought that information to the top table that you see here that says FY19 budget information. It's the 8.5 by 11 that looks like this, Chris. This is where I'm at. I handed out. Oh, <coughs> look under that. Look underneath Chris. that sheet. Okay. You've got it right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. So, what you'll see, and I'm going to go right down through the Rummy column, yep. and then it, you'll kind of explain the whole sheet. So, you have your total expense budget for this year's $3.2 million. There's offsetting revenues that let you get to allowable revenues to take in that you don't count towards taxes. There's $180,000 of that for Rumney. So the local education spending is a very key number for tax rates, is $3.08 million. That's the uh, numerator in the ratio to get to your costs per equalized pupil. Your equalized pupils for this year are 160 students, 0 0.01, and one one hundredth. And, and believe me, the, if Lori were here, that's an important one one hundredth. So, um, so your local ed spending per, per equalized pupil is $19,287 for this current budget year. Your tax rates are set on your local ed spending per equalized pupil. That's what tax rates get set by. Okay? You don't receive any federal grants or Medicaid grants that give you extra. One of the things we wanted to show, and it was because we were talking about that, for instance, you look over at Berlin, they're receiving $223,000 in school wide programs. So they, that actually pays for a little over two staff members and some other things they get, some outside coaching supports and other things. So that's this current year at Rummy. Yep, I'll stop right there. So the grants then set to lower other districts equalize pupil? One of the things, not necessarily, but one of the things that we were talking about, and this is going to go in, I'm going to take an aside after I talk about this, about some work I've been doing through my doctorate, that you have to, when you want to look 
at, at as small rural superintendents, you have to look at where your different revenues are coming from mm -hmm. to actually start to look at what's happening in different schools. And so you have to look at those outside resource opportunities to be able to say what's it look like across. I want to say it again. I said it already a couple times. I'm not necessarily advocating for the same equalized spending at all schools. I actually, that's been shown not to be a good thing to do. Okay, so I'm not advocating for it, but you have to have the numbers to think about it. Think about what's going on. So we, the next column down is all draft ones. So Berlin's already in draft two, U32's in draft two, Doty's in draft two. Next week, East Montpelier and Cal's will go through their draft twos. So these are all draft one budgets because we thought it would be good to just compare draft ones. And once we get through draft twos, we'll refresh this spreadsheet. The Romney budget that's proposed that you have in front of you tonight and that you had last time was $3.35 million. There's about $196,000 of offsetting revenue that give you a local ed spending of $3.15 million. Your equalized pupils, and this is an estimate, right now things getting data out of the agency is really slow. Um, we were supposed to have equalized pupils uh, on de by December 10th. Usually we have them like December 2nd. This year we haven't even seen them yet. So this is the best estimate that Lori and Michelle can do, and so they're usually really close. So your equalized pupils are going down almost eight students. You have an enrollment right now of 143 students, K-6. Now this is a pre-K-6 figure, but you have to have, you only, a pre-K student is forty is only forty two percent of what a kindergarten student counts towards equalized pupils. Not that they don't count, but they do in fiscal terms. So your spending per equalized pupil right now for the budget you have in front of you is twenty thousand seven hundred and fourteen. Wanted you to be able to see across the district what this looks like. And then we started to look at, this is the first time that we're able to start to look at the penalty threshold. And Chris, you've been good about asking for three or four months, hey, we'd like to know. And in talking with Laura, she's like, I'm not willing to go give those estimates because pupils has such a high effect on the threshold and where you're gonna go. So right now, Romney is 103, almost $104,000 above the threshold. Red is, and usually in fiscal, red means below, but in this case, it means you're above. But it always means bad. It always means bad. Yeah, thank you. Black means good. If you if you look across, I'm going to have you go across, you'll see the district altogether is 528, almost $529,000 below the threshold as a district. If, I want to say this, U32 is in the last year of a bond payment next fiscal year. It's a $430,000 bond payment. They have a second one that will mature in two years after that. If we level funded for FY21, which is a year from now, anticipating health care increase, health care increases this past year alone just at U32 were $130,000. The whole district will be in the threshold. Now you say, well, wait a minute, that's merged. What if we weren't merged? I've already done some quick envelope calculations for every other entity if they were by themselves, EMES and Berlin. Berlin may be the one, but I think all five entities, all six schools, if they were singleton districts, would be either at the threshold or very close to it in FY21. So I don't really think the governance either way is pushing us towards the threshold. It's our spending per equalized pupil, that is. So what I'm hearing from you is that um, cumulatively this upcoming year, we, uh, in a merged district, we would not be exceeding the threshold, but in 2021, we most likely would be. Yep. I believe we will. And if we are independent districts, then we're screwed at the moment when, with the, in the amount that we're... Well, I wouldn't quite use that language, but um, <laughs> I would say we have an issue we need to talk about. <laughs> that's, that's not a, you know, we'll move around some deck chairs, right. not figure. Yeah. So I wanted to show you what the penalty was because you've asked what the... Chris, did I go too fast? Said, what's the driver if you think that next year um, every, maybe not Berlin, but every other... Um, so this year we had 11.8% increase in health care. Yeah. 
uh, when you look at that, what's that percentage of the human resource cost? That was 3.5% of the human resource cost. Mm -hmm. So without a salary increase, and we're in negotiations right now. Our, our current negotiation increase for this past year was 2.6%. I think we'll probably be in that neighborhood, if not higher, mm -hmm. because I think that was actually really good bargaining. The boards did just keep it that low. Uh, so we're looking at 6% increase in salary probably the year after. 6% on the whole staffing is just going to drive that right up, that cost into the threshold. You mean 6% from where we are now? 6% so like of where you are at the end of next year to the year after that. Okay. So, so I'm two. compounding yeah. the three, whatever it is yeah. this year, plus the 6%, 6 to 7%. We probably have 6 or 7% coming this year once we get done with the negotiations. And the penalty and the threshold doesn't go away with merging, or it so does? It, no, it's still there. And actually, the way the legislation was written in 2015, the penalty figure is written on the CPI, so the Consumer Price Index, plus a variable, I believe it's 1%, but I'd have to go back and check this in. This is why we have Lori around uh, and Brad James at the agency. Based on the 2015 fiscal year budget numbers. So it's not based on, because the rate of growth for education has been greater than the CPI. So what it's doing is bringing the threshold lower and lower each year because it's, it's anchored back to 2015 plus CPI from then on, plus a little bit of a figure. I think it's 1%, CPI plus 1%, but education growth rate has been greater than CPI plus 1%. So this is probably an issue for schools all over the state. It's going to become more and more an issue. We are one of the more high spending issues in even districts. Romney is one or two right now in the state for this year for cost per equalized pupil. So we're, you know, that was a decision you guys made last year, said we're gonna spend right at the threshold. So it's just where we're at. Um, and more, we're just gonna hit it sooner than other districts are because of what we spend per equalized people. So is there, are you sort of, you're giving us, inf us this information which is helpful. Are you trying to tell us something? I'm not uh, trying to tell you something, yeah. but I'm trying to understand because of the reason Chris and I talked before the meeting, and I said, I think this is an intertwined connect conversation about what, the reason I've been asking your priorities is we're all going to, and I've been asking this mm -hmm. of all boards, is because we're going to be in tough fiscal times. We're not going to get out of them for a long, long time unless we do something like Addison Central did two years ago, and they decided to reset the whole system so they didn't have to have this conversation. But they had to do drastic cuts in personnel and restructure their system because they were the highest spender in the state. And then they said their board said, we don't want to keep having this conversation every year. And they went to a restructuring and to a staff reduction, a heavy staff reduction, over 25 people, teachers. I don't even know how many support staff. It was a tough year for them last year. But they said they didn't want to keep having this discussion year and year and year. I'm not telling you to advise you that. I'm trying to give you information. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to give you information to make good decisions. Um, and so you know, the penalty, if we stayed where we are right now, is an extra 3.7 cents. The tax rate per 100 with this current budget would be $1.88. That's with C last year's CLA. Okay, we're projecting this with last year's CLA. CLA won't come in until the end of the month. Uh, if, and is the anticipation that will be the same? Or so housing costs order? have been going up around the state. Okay. I haven't been paying attention just to Middlesex, so I just know that around the state, housing costs have been going up. And that would benefit? That's going to, well, well, you just benefit? reassessed. It'll probably bring down your CLA because as the house, you know, as the assessment gets off of the, if the housing costs become greater and the assessment stays constant, you'll start to lower your CLA percentage. You're at about 102% because you just reassessed last year. Okay. I believe that's what it is. I'd have to go check that number. If we were a merged district, the education tax rate before it hit CLA would be $1.79. That's why we left that whole row blank, but it shows it over on the district, all the way on the right-hand side. Do you all see that? Mm -hmm. So if we took that and then applied CLA, last year's CLA, the Romney, the Middlesex tax rate for educating pre-K through graduation students would be $1.77. 
So the merging of the district would be a lowering of the tax rate of 11 cents with the current budget you have now. I can tell you that Callis, I know, is coming in with a much lower budget than where they're at. Doty, last night, I didn't stay, but I'm assuming you accepted the budget where we had it, the recommendations. So that 29000 that they were over is now gone. Uh, there's a couple thousand below the threshold, right at the threshold, but a couple thousand below it overall. So that will lower their tax rate. That would lower, if they were independent, their tax rate by a, probably about two and a half cents, because it's about 13000 the advisor. Okay. So that, I give you just as information. Again, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm not trying to push you. I, Brian, I'm glad you asked that question. I'm not trying to give you subtle information or you know, where to go. I want you to know this and think about the priorities that you have as a board. Because, you know, I thought about, Amy and I talked about, should we come with cuts, should we come, and I said, you know what, I don't want to go with cuts. I want to hear what the priorities are, and for you to tell us where you want us to go do some work and sharpen our pencils. We'll come back. We can either come back to you. The other thing we're doing with all the other boards, I have said, we're, the new board is now sitting on January 14th, the transition board, and they have the responsibility to present a budget forward. Romney is the one place I'm thinking about that you may want to have another time to talk as a board before your representatives work with the transition board to build a merge budget if that's the direction we go or if we're independent, how do we want to go that way? I mean, I know we're playing this two ways. The executive committee was good at telling me, Bill, build the budgets independent, then just put them together. Okay. So um, where does the... Uh, I'm trying to figure out where the SU budget comes into play here because if this this is um, can be paid, um, it should be shared all across the board, um, and the SU budget was adopted. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering well, why, why adopted or recommended? It's built into these budgets. It's an assessment right. for right. equalized people. So the, I'm wondering if the uh, if there's a concern that we're all going to be over the threshold within a year. Uh, why there isn't more coordination in terms of developing local budgets and then figuring out what we can afford for the SU budget. Um, is that off the table for this year? No, I don't think it is. It, emer it emerged and, um, you know, that's fine. I mean, they, as you know, Chris, because you sit on the executive committee and hear it, there's more regulation while they push that down on the schools. Right. Does the so, school uh, personnel will have to take on regulatory work and reporting work to, um, to the Agency of Education? Mm -hmm. So was that a one point, was less than 2% increase, yeah. right? 1.96. But it's 1.96 of 4 million, 5 million, I don't remember. 9 million. 9 million. Um, because of special oh, education. No, and, and transportation. And transportation, and transportation is in there too. Right? There too. Yeah. So, I mean, if you remember, the SU core functions only went up 14,000. Mm -hmm. Transportation went up 9. Special education went up 153,000. Yeah. So... And those, I mean, those are services. When you ask me what are instructional services, special education is an instructional service. Mm -hmm. When I look at instructional services, I combine the what are called ancillary services like nursing, library, instructional services, and special education. If you remember back, what's, we had a couple of meetings ago, we had the chart that had the multi-year budget look. There's a pie that's in there, and I try it. Those core services should be about 65 to 70 percent of your budget, and it, there isn't anyone in Washington Central that has those core services anywhere close to that percentage. If we were in Montpelier, they're pretty close to that, spending that much money on instruction. Mm -hmm. Just because I get to see that budget too. Uh, So if we had a just a same budget next year that we do this year, mm -hmm. we would be out of this problem, right? No, we'd be in it. Why? Because next year the tar the threshold's going to no, no, come down. This, this current budget that we're talking about. Yeah. We have fewer students. Yeah. What? <clears throat> we'll have fewer students to divide the total by. Right. Amy but brought some enrollment. We increase it at all. What? If we didn't increase the budget at all, we would right, be, but we'd be dividing it by 143 instead of 166. I mean, our, our equalized pupils is a two-year average, which is going to go down even more. Okay, but 
Isn't aren't we dividing the three four um, three point five essentially? I'm not sorry, three point one five two on this year's budget by a hundred and fifty two. As opposed to three point oh eight six from last year. No, we're yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe maybe the, oh and is it just based on the per pupil that puts us over the threshold as opposed to total budget? Well, you can look at it either way. I could get I could give you that number well, instead of 103. I could give you money. A, the same per pupil, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I could take that 103 and divide it by a, uh, 152 and tell you what you need to lower your per, head spending per, per pupil. pupil. Right? You could do it either way. I think it's easier to know the most people usually in budgeting look at round number at the whole numbers, not per equalized pupil. Okay, but we meet the penalty because of the per pupil spending, right? Okay. Um. So we're looking at cuts. Yep. Well, it depends. You tell me. Do you because Brian asked last time, how much are we willing to spend over the threshold? I think that's your first sure. question. Yeah. I, mean, I asked that. Question. You did ask that question. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but you did. Have, might have been rhetorical. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I think. But, well, no, I think I'll it is crazy. I'll give it. I'll no, agree no, with Chris. It's courageous, and I think it's the first question you should you should say. Where are you as a community? Where do you think the community is in spending over the threshold? Minutes. I've watched uh, many of your fellow board members at their other boards ask that same question, yeah. and uh, I think that's the first question. And then, you know, that, there's several after that. So is this budget that's proposed uh, one that you think is needed in order to service our students the way they should be serviced and, to, and provide the services they need? I think I would have to say, you know, I want more clarity on what your priorities are. and. Um, I do think it's important to look at the long range um, kind of uh, following pupil um, number that is being projected. And um, so, yeah. Do you want to talk about some of the data that you brought? Yeah. Um, this uh, report is from NESDEC. And as we look at the enrollment uh, projections by grade, you know, we're looking at a K-6 enrollment in 2023 of 123 kids. Oh, how many? 123 kids. In what year? 20, within the next four years, 2022 to 2023, it's projecting 123. And that is not an anomaly within, you know, a span that they're pretty sure of, you know. So, you know, you get into squishier numbers once you can't track direct birds and, and that kind of thing. But, um, so, you know, you're looking at, one tw according to this, K, K6, 124 and 21, 22, 123 and 22, 23. So I'm like, I'm just wanting to signal that, you know, I think we need to be thinking proactively um, in realizing that we're not necessarily different than anywhere else in Vermont as our population is dropping. So. I'm anticipating a question that might be asked with that, I guess, is how, how has that indicator in the past held up? So that's a projection from last year and that projected for this current year to have 139 students, and we have 143. It, it, it usually is. I mean, when I look at it across the schools, we've been doing this, we've been working with NESDAG now for five or six years to run enrollment projections. And, you know, plus or minus five, six for our small schools. And at U32, it's actually even sharper because it's there's a bigger number of students and it's easier to be more on target. But I've never seen it, you know, a projection be off by like 10 or 12. I haven't seen it up in that area. And I do go back and look and say kind of like, what does it look like compared to what we projected in? It's gotten better every year as we give them more and more data because they they have a demographic that's, they employ one and they do it for all over New England schools. 
is more part of them to keep these projections going. And they say, just as Amy just said, if the kids are born, we're a lot sharper than the next five years, from year five to year six through ten. Do you have a number for 2021? I just didn't know. So 2021, they have it at 127. And we have 143 this year? Yeah. Or, and, you, and would you anticipate that to be true for the 19 to 20? So for the next year, 143? What was that? We have 143 this year. And do you think, is that going to hold steady for the year starting in August? So for so I'm going 2018, to yeah, 2020. I'll be that. So, oh, yeah, yeah. I would go to this, I, I'm just telling Amy to use the current enrollment numbers we know with pre-K mm -hmm. and what we have, because what you have to look at is what's going to come in at kindergarten and leave at sixth grade. Mm -hmm. That's the differential you have to look at. So it's looking like we've got 18 total pre-K pre that are, would be rising and we're graduating 20. And that includes the students that are on tuition vouchers. Mm -hmm. that number. The 20? The 18. The 18. The Who are outside this tour yeah, going to a different... If there's thing. some that aren't in our yep. here, yep. you'd have to look at that. So that would then bring it down to 141 or so? If those numbers... If, if so everything else if stays, everything stays, stays the, the same. same, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I, uh, I'm looking at one thing. So are we talking about equalized pupils here? No, they're just no. enrollment. Just straight enrollment. So here's, okay, here's, I could get a lot more technical about equalized and I just don't no, want to no, make no, it foggy. But equalized is usually about 90 to 92 percent of your enrollment number. Okay. I'm just trying to look at kind of where the trend is, so is going. So, e so then equalized is less than the enrollment number? Yes. So if our, if our equalized this year is 160. It's a okay. two-year average, two-year two rolling average. Two-year rolling average, okay. Was there a significant decrease from last year to this year? Yep. Well, we graduated. We had a bubble class the, yeah. last year. Yeah, so I mean, in 15, 16, you had, uh, so I don't have last year's right here. I didn't write it down. You had 165 students. I mean, okay. in, in 2012, 2013, you had 163 students. Back in 2007, 2008, you had 134 students. Yeah, so really, it, yeah. it's, you know, we know we've had those two bubble classes coming through. Okay. And we've increased class number of classes because of it. Yeah, your class, your cl your grade levels right now range anywhere from, you know, K to, K to six, you're ranging anywhere from 18 to 21, 20, well, there's a 24 in fifth grade. None below 18? None below 18, but you have, you know, that's not your classes, that's your numbers per grade. Okay. I gave you your grade numbers, not your class numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so the question is, do we want to, do, do we want to worry about the special? in terms of recommending budget? Yes. Okay. Uh, and I would say for two reasons. One, obviously for tax <coughs> payers, but also I think in the, in, regardless of where, what we might feel about what may be happening, I think sort of starting off a merge process with, you know, a budget that's above the threshold, I think would not probably, would not foster a good starting sort of partnership with other schools. And if, as a result, cuts were made to eliminate that threshold, what kind of message is that going to send them back to the community? So I, th I feel like uh, while we may not be potentially setting the budget uh, with this, I think that if we can stave off any further unnecessary just damage of um, I'm just like you know I, I, of the goodwill you know so it's, it's like uh, yes but, but 
going into a merger, we're faced with that anyway because there's some um, we're taking on debt uh, from other towns that already have it, uh, and so. Um, so do we want to pile on? No, I'm not saying we do. I think we want to be fiscally, fiscally responsible for our building our community, and I think we should not be in a penalty because I just I think that was in the wrong message. Uh, so I think we should look, you know, look within our means. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm not so concerned about the relationship with the merged district for that reason, just because you know there are we're, we're faced with that uh, anyway. Meaning that others well, are going to bring new baggage. We all bring some baggage to it. You know, you don't want. I think everybody does. Yeah, everybody. I baggage, think everybody so does. Just, I, I'm just. Yeah. We don't want to. We don't want to ignore the fact that we want to have a fiscally sound house. I think. So I, I agree with your sentiment. In, in that, but different reason for it. Um, so, how do you want to, how do you want to approach us? Uh, um, you know, I think we really like that balance in here for the discussion on you know where our, where, how we want to attach, uh, attack this or or evaluate where we think um, reductions can be made. So, I'm really torn on this because. Um, both of our administrators have said that it would be helpful for them coming with a next draft if they knew what the board's priorities were. Mm -hmm. um, and I can see that, but at the same time, I've also um, been a principal where without the board's priorities, I saw where there was excess. And I don't necessarily think our priorities will help the administrators come forward with recommendations. But generally, I like to do what they ask. Mm -hmm. um, but I almost feel like maybe if we just said we would like to see a draft that keeps us away from the threshold, that might push us towards knowing our priorities. So, for example, um, when I was a principal and there was 143 kids and two full-time school counselors, and the state um, guidelines is one for every 200, mm -hmm. um, it was kind of a no-brainer, but it was a really emotional issue because it was a K-12 school and one did elementary. Um, <clears throat> and so I guess what I'm saying is if the board's priorities, it almost could have gotten in the way, is what I'm saying. And if there is um, I guess there might be value in just letting the administrators and the staff decide what the priorities are in terms of um, where we could cut. <clears throat> so like... So can I say something to you? Yeah. I've gone down the road with having the staff in the discussion and cuts. It gets very divisive in a building and I would never recommend it because it pits staff against staff. If you want to really ruin a climate in the building, East Montpelier did that six years five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. I would I would argue strongly against that. I've I, seen I, some I, schools where where it's worked. I think it has to be um, kind of framed in a really specific way so that it's not necessarily about yeah. staff. It's about efficiencies and that type of thing. But So I, I just want to tell you, it, the times I've been through it, it yeah. I, I can't recommend that to you. I can't agree with you. Let me just put it that way. I can't agree with you, Caroline. I also think one of my core values as a governance piece is a public school is to serve the public in which it's in its area. And part of that is knowing the values of the community. You are the trustees for the community for this school. You should be able to say we prioritize it. It doesn't mean I won't, if you said something I didn't agree with, I wouldn't let you know or that I wouldn't come back with other options to do. U32, in their end of their November meeting, 
told Stephen and I to put the whole food service budget into the budget. Then they came back and said, no, we're 100000 over. We have a 100000 deficit. Put that in the budget. Stephen and I came back with a budget that didn't do that. We weren't willing to do it. We said, we're not willing to cut a teacher and a half to fund food service for a $100,000 deficit. We're willing to do other things, but we're not willing to do that. And so we, we cut a position in the food service at U32 right now in draft two. We've cut a bunch of paraeducators at U32 to get it, because they are four, almost $400,000 over the 3% target that the board gave us. Okay, so has there been any discussion with the staff about um, budget priorities um, from that? No, there hasn't. Um, you know, I do think Caroline has a, I think staff is a vital component of delivering the services that we um, want to deliver. And, you know, it's not, they're not in a bubble, I, I don't think, and you know, cuts that potential cuts that will be made certainly affect them. And I think they can have input and insight into where things can work differently um, because they're doing it every day. Um, not, not that you're necessarily controlled by what the staff is saying, but getting the insight from them as to how efficiencies might be achieved can be helpful. And if it needs to be by maybe anonymous. Suggestions right. yeah. for writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Absolutely. could do it yeah. that way. Even yeah. though, even doesn't. though, like this small community, you kind of know where it's coming yeah. from. But just to get the insight from the staff members who are actually doing the work so, in the classroom. So here's what I would say. Yeah. Because I'm so strong for the two times I've gone through this and what it's done to morale, I want this board to vote to direct me to do that. Mm -hmm. Because it is one of those things that will really hurt the morale in this building. Yeah, I've, well, I was going to say, I think I know, well, I'll respond to that, and then I was going to say something else. I will say, as a teacher who's worked in, a, in buildings where, I don't know that it has happened that way, but any time there is discussion around cuts, it affects morale and probably performance for probably the rest of the year. Um, and so it's, I think it would be, uh, I mean, input is great, but an input where there's only... 20 people who work here means that one to two of those people would lose their jobs. That's like too small of a, mm -hmm. a data pool to have people talking about what that means because it becomes there's it becomes individuals becomes personalized. as opposed to a, a, an employer of 100,000 people because uh, it's such a tiny environment. But um, what I, I guess one thing I wanted to share um, that I've been hearing throughout the meetings is the when I think about the priorities of the board, it seems like the board's priorities are around the opportunity gap and what we can do to support our students learning. <laughs> and I mean, that's the mission of the school, but that seems like it's been the mission and the priority for uh, ever since I've been coming to these meetings. So I think that rises to the surface to me in terms of identifying priorities. We want to ensure that we have the highest quality instruction possible for students so that they can have the best shot. Um, um, at achieving, so that's that's what I hear as an as an observer of the meetings. That's been your priority before budget. Uh, and, and I think that's a fair statement, but then you have to talk about specifics as what is, what do we provide to, to try and achieve that, um, and whether proposed cuts will feed into that, or you have to cut other things that may not have an impact on that. Well, my tendency to think is that most of what we do has an impact on student education and achievement to varying degrees. And so, I think mean, that becomes the one part, I think, is to figure out what, what can be done with that most painlessly. And I, I mean, I think it also depends, like, what we're, what we're talking about. So, for example, the... Um, survey that was created when Bill and Allison worked together where we ranked um, content areas. If somebody put, you know, math and literacy kind of in a higher priority than, say, art and PE, that doesn't necessarily mean that we would want a point eight PE teacher. 
you know what I mean? Like, so if we have, as a board did that, it may or may not relate to budgetarily where it makes sense. Um, and I mean, the other thing is, you know, class size has come up from the community. Um, statistically, class size is the, what is it, the least valuable place to spend money. In terms of student, student progress. In terms, in terms of learning. student achievement. I mean, shrink, like, sh shrinking getting a, the class size? Right, no. so keeping a class size, you know, 22 and below has the least impact on student learning. But, even though I'm the budget, like, <laughs> I want to keep the budget small, I don't pay Vermont taxes to have a class of 30 kids. Um, my kids in classes of 30 kids. Um, so I just think that it's really tricky. And like we last year added the kindergarten class so that the kindergarten didn't have, what was it going to be, 22? Yeah, I mean, it's currently. So is that a luxury? Is it a priority? Like, I think it's really. But there's it's split between two. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. I think it's tricky. So, it, oh, Amy, based on the um, anticipated, based on student population um, per grade, um, are there reconfigurations in terms of what classes should be? I mean, can you, can you, can, can there be combinations because the, the um, uh, issues that we had dealt with because we had a larger group is no longer there, but the structure stayed the same. We actually reconfigured some. We've got straight first, straight second, and the kindergarten is currently split so that it's still at 10 each. Uh, three, four is blended, um, but all of the class sizes, with the exception of kindergarten in K2, are, um, there's plenty of little bodies in those rooms, mm -hmm. one, two. So I don't think you literally could have put there's not going to be an advantage to, to that, and there were real reasons the teachers felt like um, it benefited students' learning for them to actually have a straight first and a straight second at that mm -hmm. point because of the foundational knowledge the kids were building during that time. So, anything with the kindergarten class in terms of um, we've been yeah. talking some on uh, K2 and just ways to support the kind of um, student needs within um, various classrooms and um, you know that's something that I was hoping to dialogue with them to make sure that we were anticipating um, incoming needs as best we can as well as the current groups um, to come up with the best configuration. Um, I was not anticipating framing that in a reduction uh, kind of way, um, but more like just dialoguing on, you know, do we need a second first grade teacher, you know, or like does somebody need to move up to teach first grade, you know, um, or what? But. Can I just say that Vermont's suggestions for K2 or 18 and below for grades you know, for second grade and below, that's the recommendation. Um, this district has never set a class size policy. Um, you know, we're required to have one. We, we I think we have yeah, we we have the SUSU one. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it, the SUY. No, so but it's SUY. So no, it's the average. A minimum of eighteen, or we're aiming for average. Maximum of eighteen. Maximum of eighteen. But it's the average first grade class for all the schools in the SU. So it doesn't mean that Rumney can't ever have a class over 18. I understand. I understand Rumney had basically an ongoing policy of not having more than 18 students. Yeah, we tried not to. That that. We, and we, we, yeah, yeah. And we've had some kindergartens that have been ones that I wouldn't want to support of 23 and 24 kids. And we, even though we had extra bodies, adults in there, I don't think that's the way to go. And I'm not trying to push you there. I'm just trying no. to give you information. And I want to be really clear because I wouldn't want uh, a K2 teacher thinking that I was trying to isolate an area for a cut. What I'm saying is um, that was another issue that has sort of come up at the board level before and in terms of like moving staff around and um, 
and the size of classes both in specials and in um, the regular grades. So I just when we when we talk about priorities and we have the budget at the same time, I guess my point is it makes it um, uh, hard to know where the decisions about priorities how it how it affects the numbers. In, are, we dealing, are you dealing with the situation that exists each, this year um, that has a budget impact that will not exist next year? I'm not following you across. In terms of a special, you know, is there an expense? Like a balloon, oh, yeah, yeah, balloon class. I or mean, I think what were, um, you know, our one, two numbers are probably based on move ins and some unanticipated things are a little higher than what I think we would like. But, you know, quite honestly, you don't shoot kids away mm -hmm. with <laughs> projections like these. So. We're supporting um, that based on the content area in some pretty creative uh, ways as a staff and actually feel good about uh, the instruction that's happening there. Um, I don't think that that is going away, though. Um, so does that answer your the big yeah, class size? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're going to, well, I mean, currently we've got 20. It's going to be the same thing going up to first grade next year, you know, because there's 20 kindergartners across two classrooms right now, um, you know. Mm -hmm. I guess let me ask a question that's probably evident to everybody in this room except for me, which is when we're talking about, everybody's talking about staff when we're talking about cuts. Is that sort of an understanding or are we, yeah, yeah, I mean it seems no. to me that we should also be looking at non-staff issues. So, absolutely. I mean your building, okay. your building costs are pretty much fixed. Okay. Your transfer to capital is about the only thing that isn't fixed for the building. It, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm okay, I wish I had had time to do this year that I've been thinking about because I've been seeing a colleague do it. When they look across their district, they say, "What are the costs that are not fixed, dependent on the number of kids, and what are the costs that are fixed that are variable with the number of kids in schools?" Um, so, you know, electricity is not going to change. Wood chips are not going to. Wood pellets are not going to change. Oil is not going to change. The to clean this building is not going to change. To the level you wanted it at. And the gym floor, we were going to redo the gym floor, gym walls or whatever. Is that in our cap? I mean, is that a separate budget? We yeah. usually do that out of our capital Got piece. It. We don't okay. do it out of our overall okay. budget. That's what I was thinking yeah. about. And, um, and so we, uh, you guys, if you remember last year, we actually, and um, it was my recommendation, we, so we were presented, geez, I think it was two years ago now, with a five-year capital improvement plan or just not even improvement, just maintenance. Uh, Keeping the fund. And, and what those costs associated with it. And it was sort of an average $100,000 contribution. 120, 120, 120, 120, between 100 and 120, right? It was 120. It was 120. It was 120. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so we reduced it. Right? We reduced, well, we reduced it because uh, based on a sort of a five year average, that it was, we were still. Uh, in the in the range, but I noticed in this budget that's still at ninety. Um, so than rather up. than going back up, uh, so we're already, you know, underfunding. Uh, at least we've been told needs to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's it. So that would be kind of interesting. Did I cut you off though? No, that's fine. Is if somebody. How did we, I wasn't on the board then, maybe it yes, was a separate were. committee. No, when the numbers, like how this group came very passionately, said that was what was needed. It wasn't Is that a group. needed? Uh, it wasn't no, a group. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was Matt Colbo, who used to work yeah. for us as facilities manager across the SU. That I one asked, I was here for. Yeah, right. There, so we're talking. I'm talking, there was um, previous board members who came also voicing that this oh so so yeah, with that with, with that if i understand what you're saying there was a when when the bond mm -hmm. uh the push for the bond there was some board members who were spearheading that that felt that they had basically made a promise to the community that they that we would maintain mm -hmm. a um 
flush capital fund to not put the community in the situation. Okay. And, and because that so question came up over and over, why weren't you planning to do this yeah. all yep. along? And, and that went along with the mass report. Yeah, that's that where the 120, the 120 okay. we feel pretty good about. Okay. Although he did five years. When you start to look at it and you look at the life of systems in this building, and we're starting to face it at U32, it's 20 years since that bond. Yeah. We're starting to hit the mate, some of the major systems need repair. Luckily, with the way they have I mean, land their capital they fund, they're going to keep using years. that, and it's going to take care of it, and we'll not have to go back to the community and bond. Right. And so but there's some the, major was, systems. Because the community was saying, why, why are we doing a bond? Why wasn't it done all along? Right, right. So yep. that was, and, and it was, I think we made a representation yeah. of the community that we would yeah, I yeah. Think you did. have the capital yep. fund and try and avoid yep. doing another bond. So, yeah. Yep, um, and, uh, and, yeah, okay. Yeah. So are there other things like that in our budget that we could get the data to support kind of what has been done so like having matt come and he did analysis of the building mm -hmm. and he provided us a report that went with the numbers with kind you of the emotion you recommended the most one yes yeah. so are there other areas of our budget that we could so when you go at. the reason you you have this sheet right here you know as woden was asking what's instructional and what's not instructional mm -hmm. you can look over here at the functions mm -hmm. And so when, you know, I'll go right down with the ones that I think are instructional here. When you look at, and I'm saying instructional, and I don't mean it as any. Mm -hmm. It would be easy to show us what's not instructional. Well, there's some, things, there's some things that I would say that you could think of differently. It wouldn't be popular. I'm going to give you things that aren't popular. <laughs> okay. So the first three, the instructional services, preschool program and guidance services are instructional. Health services, I agree with Amy's statement, while kids need health services, it's not an instructional piece. Mm -hmm. Curriculum services is only at the high school. It's not something that's here. Library services are instructional. Technology services I would argue could be instructional, could not be, and the reason I'll say that is because we use so much computing as part of, we don't buy textbooks anymore, we're doing a lot through, while we are buying a lot of reading books, which is a good thing, um, we're using technology to access a lot of information. Then you get into the Board of Education Services are not, SU assessments are not. I would argue the office of the principal is needed for instructional services. Some may not, but I would. Interest in expense, operation of plant management, student transportation debt services are not. Food service transfer is not an instructional expense. Capital fund transfer is not. When you see special education, local special education support from the SU, that is instructional. English language learners is you don't have any co-curriculars. What is food service transfer? Because our food service runs a deficit. Uh, all Most food services in Vermont. No, that's basically. not that's not true. Because there's Doty or something. No, there are there are other districts that have found ways to balance their food service costs. It's not popular. Things like the the Abbey Group. Right. That's what I. Which is an outside service, an outside corporation come in and takes care of your food right. service. Um, and the way they do it is they add, we, well, our biggest expense for our food service is our HR costs. And we provide full benefits to all our HR, I actually, to all our food service. I think it's a good thing. I want to do it. But, um, but it, we pay for it. But there aren't schools who don't outsource that stay within their budget, are there? There are some, yeah. Is um, tuition reimbursement, is that, that's not a contractual piece, um, correct? Uh, are you in the budget? I'm actually under instructional services, but that's the biggest amount. Um, so we actually underfund that for what our liability is for the contract. Okay, so that is contractual. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's not touchable. It's negotiations. So, no, it's, it's yeah, but it's not. Oh, right. So we'll see what happens. There's nothing you can make a decision about that. And you wouldn't, well, in my opinion, that would not be an area to cut because that's how you get educators who continue their education, like long learners. So is there anything in here, even the non-instructional, that are not essential to provide support for the instruction? I, it's hard to say no. 
To, it's hard to say. To, it's hard to tell you. It's hard to tell you there is. I right. I can't say there isn't. I mean, it's it, you say, said it well, Chris, before when you were talking with Katie. It it it's making um, maybe the best of the worst of the worst options. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're looking at you know how do we change this? Um, there are ways. They won't be popular, and it would be making and. You know, when you're looking at $103,000, there's a lot of personnel expenses in this budget. When you look at those non-instructional areas, there's a you know operation plant plant maintenance outside the debt service. The highest piece we pay is the three employees that work for us to help keep the building running. It's going to hit somebody. So I'm more than willing to talk to you about all the different lines and everything, but you know, if, if there was some direction and area you wanted us to go look at, um, the reason I was thinking about priorities, that's a way to have the discussion. They, you know, I, I think, you know, where I will agree with Caroline on this, because it seems like you and I have been kind of going a little back and forth, I think having some direction from the board is always helpful, and then we bring you back, how did we get there? So, well, no. I, I, I would love to say that I have a great model that I want to follow, but I have the opposite. What I don't want to have happen, I worked for an SU and the board had said we had to make certain cuts and that it needed to be personnel. So we did as the administrative team and people got RIF notices. The board then under pressure because the cuts hurt, backed off of all of them. So it destroyed morale, it destroyed trust with the administrators, and it destroyed the administrators relationship with the board. So I just want to be really careful. I, I don't like the idea of going up against the threshold. I also don't like the idea of taking us like throwing a dart at the dartboard of where I think cuts should happen because I have no idea here. If we ask if if a recommend if recommended cuts are going to come and they're going to be public, I will feel pressure to I don't know I guess stand behind it. Like I don't want to ask for something I'm not able to stand behind. Like when we asked for a level funded budget or no more than a three percent increase, those are things I can like stand behind and support the administrator for bringing us like the tough. We didn't get new laptops this year or whatever it is. I'm feeling really like. 103,000 seems like a big chunk to reduce. And I just worry that if a proposal comes forward and we're not able as a five person board to stand behind it, five zero vote, mm -hmm. I, I just think it's gonna, um, I guess I would wanna be very cautious that we know what we're asking for and what we could potentially be facing at our next meeting in terms of choices. Yeah. Well, I think I, I think that it's um, if we're asking the administration to come back with a revised budget that gets us underneath the threshold, I think it's pretty apparent that was it personnel is going to be affected in order to drive down that number. Um, so uh, I can at least appreciate why direction is being asked uh, because. Um, you know, there's not, this isn't, there there's, isn't going to be a positive outcome um, for some people uh, in this, you know, and so we're, I guess, maybe echoing what you're saying to a certain extent about being able to get behind it, but also what, what role can we play in, you know, to a certain extent, prying Providing some level of direction for the administrators, so um, you know it's just it's a shared responsibility that we all own, mm -hmm. like everyone on this table owns, and it's not pitting you know us against each other, us against the administration. Uh, you know, so 
I don't know if that's achievable, but I'd like for us mm -hmm. to try to do that. And is there any anticipated retirements? You and I were thinking exactly like Chris. Um, I mean, just because if there is, I, I'm you. not aware of any. I think that is one way to kind of thread that difficult without things feeling icky. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's one way to just say, you know, we're mm -hmm. looking at kind of a constrained budget season. If you are considering, would you please let me know? You know, because I think it can provide us some other options that yeah. are less divisive between people. Mm. Yeah, we've taken over a million, 1.2 million out of U32 in the past five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've taken over a million, 1.2 million out of U32. Projected increases based on the dollars back then. I mean, we've increased budgets, but they would have gone much faster without resizing the staff. Mm -hmm. All but one has been attrition's and retirements. Mm -hmm. Now, is this with uh, incentives to do so? No. Okay. Incentives yeah. actually cost you more. Um, um, so let me give you some figures just so you know yeah. some figures. The uh, when we use uh, modeling for salary for a teacher, yep. we average about seventy eight thousand dollars per year for total cost, pennies and salary. That's about the average. And for uh, support staff, it's about forty five to fifty thousand dollars. So yeah, the total cost. They they don't get their salary is almost half of what their benefits are. It's oh, almost fifty fifty for cost. Yeah. No, I know their salaries are. Now, it, it depends on the, it depends on the person whether they're taking a single two person okay. parent family yeah. or a family yeah. plan. Okay. But a family plan total cost is about twenty four thousand really dollars plus the other benefits. The MTSS position. Uh, I, yes, and and the other I mean they're one. There are two people in the building, 1.5 position, I believe, isn't it? Um, I don't see them as principal support. No, I mean, those like, are, those <laughs> are, yes, those I see are, them as students. Yeah, they, they, I, but, I, would, I would say that I would argue the opposite, that, that I think that is, to Katie's point of the achievement gap, mm -hmm. I think that type of position is crucial um, to supporting students. I would be adamantly against cuts in that area. Yeah, I think it's um, that those are positions that are just needed in schools now so that teachers can provide instruction to students. Um, I can say that they are, you know, I, I, they're doing good work. and. Um, can't imagine. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I certainly see that. It's also we were dealing with it before. Clearly, there were lots of problems, and we needed at least one of those people. You know, sort of. We needed to be on them, and that's kind of <coughs> so that's the spot that I see. Um, what if, um, on the flip side of it, uh, is there a way to generate more revenue? Mm -hmm. um, so it out? has. So it has to be allowable revenue that you can deduct from your expense. So there's, while you saw the, the spreadsheet that I have right here, that um, see how it says total offsetting revenues, you can't go set up, and this is what Stowe tried to do back for when Act 60, between Act 60 and Act 68, they had the Stowe fund, mm -hmm. and they said, okay, we'll just make it so there's less overall local spending. So what the legislator responded with was Act 68 in 2002 or 2004 that said, okay, you got to count those in your tax book base. So you could go try to do fundraising for what you're doing, but that wouldn't lower your tax cost and your penalty. I mean, they, because that's what was done. There was the Stowe Education Foundation Fund. I worked in Stowe at that point. And they were able to drive down their taxes by people paying. Mm -hmm. basically, they went around to everyone and said, you're paying a second tax to the fund. And it lowered the taxes, but it... So that was correct. Does that count even with external grants? 
I'm not, not saying that the Gates Foundation is not going to give us money or something. Right, but it, it, it has to be an allowable offsetting revenue. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I, I, I don't have the definition with me. Okay, I, I go. I, I just want. I don't want to get into the like what because I'd have to get Lori here and get the tuition. Tuition. Yeah, if we had tuition students coming. Yeah, if we had tuition students that were allowable to come from this uh, ascending town that were sending, but um, like tuition from. I'd have to look into it if it were tuition from like. And Bob Pillars talked about having students come from overseas and mm -hmm. how that affects your tax rate. I'd have to look into that. But I'm not sure. I guess where I was where I was going with this, and this may not be the direction to, for if he's going to be going tonight, um, but I think of pre-K, and are we are we serving all the kids we potentially could be serving um, in pre-K in this community? And if we aren't, would there be a way to generate some revenue if we were by bringing more pre by bringing more pre-Ks? Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, it's more of a space issue, right? In the building? Yeah, I mean, with, there's certain a certain number of students were allowed um, for the square footage that we have. Um, so, how close are we to that? Pardon? Me? How close are we to that? Uh, we have we actually have some openings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. But I mean, part of the problem is is that for many working families, our format doesn't exactly work, and we don't have an extra room um, current, under current configurations where we could have a partner program running in the same way that East Montpelier does. Yeah, or that would be Jody has a they have full day option. So we are sometimes, but the two kids are five days a week. Could then presumably have. No. Okay. <laughs> it's not five days. It just no, it's just three. three. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's oh, similar okay. to ours. Yeah. But I think that's, you know, as a working parent, if I could send my preschooler to Romney and I would pay, I mean, I pay over $50 a day to go somewhere else, that's way less convenient and less nurturing. <laughs> I'd rather send them here. I'd like to have that happen. It's just, it's well, I mean, space. to Brian's point about right. it. Yeah. It's, but I mean, it's a space could. issue because of, um, so I, so I think about a few years ago, we had a space issue with the renovations and we resolved it by, um, being creative. Working uh, with Doty, yeah. Well, I, oh, I, okay. Working with Doty, that's one way. I was thinking about some of the instruction took place, uh, in, in classrooms. And I, I heard at our last, uh, at our meeting with staff, the, the, maybe this isn't universal, it's just one staff person saying this, is that while they, they are able to collaborate with their core team more now, uh, they would like to be able to collaborate more with the allied arts. And if we're bringing the allied arts into the classroom, um, you know, is that a way to create that type of opportunity with creating space, and I know I'm getting down probably too far into the weeds <laughs> with this. But it but might be helpful to know what would that revenue look like, and right. if we could. The other challenge, though, is the um, we have to work under childcare regs. Sure, um, bathrooms in the classroom, and right, and so oh. that would be oh, also mm -hmm. um, yeah. a challenge to create a. A somewhat larger class like Matt's space is very large and would accommodate that number for the mixed play and learning opportunities that you want happening in kindergarten but it was is his room is optimal to it just poses some questions around that space allocation I mm -hmm. think the other piece is that we didn't used to have a separate art and music room yeah, so that, I mean, this is why I ask you about priorities. I don't need you to mm -hmm. figure out the total solution. Mm -hmm. The pre-K one, we, you know, we, we run a, we own community connections, so we've been using community connections to service these preschool extended day opportunities throughout the district. Um, they aren't money makers for us. They're barely breaking even to keep people able to come. So I just want to let you know, it doesn't mean it couldn't be. Don't hear me as couldn't be, but it would, you'd have, we'd have to look at other 
models for that. Um, but, you know, knowing those things is, you know, are trying to th think creatively and say, hey, solve this with, you know, are we willing to collapse music and art into one room? You know, where is that on the priority over a classroom size of 10 each in the kindergarten? You know, where is that for you as a board? You and know, would we want it, if it was a 10 and a 9, would we prefer, you know, one class or two? Yeah, we, yeah, I don't know if that's a board choice. But no, I, I know. I know what you're saying, Caroline. There's a point where it isn't. Where I'm going right back to is what Brian said. I want to make sure we stand together because there's going to be hard decisions and there, people are going to feel that they're personal. But then they're not meant to be. We're trying yeah. to make that priority list. And that's why I think it's so crucial for a board to have that before you get into budget season. You can say, we said this is what we wanted. That's, you know, as Katie was saying about instruction, East Montpelier told us, they've told us every year for the past three years, like, ensures that kids who are getting tier two and tier three in services is happening. You can't touch that. You can go touch whatever you want, but that's our number one. And so that's why I'm kind of asking you, what is your number one, or what are the things that you're saying, like, these are, come back, meet this target, what is it that you can't touch? Or we see this as our highest piece. You don't have to tell me what you get. You don't want us to touch. But, you know, some of that reflection helps for when Amy and I sit down and look at this and say, and, you know, as you said, tomorrow we're going to be saying, I know you were saying that tomorrow you're going to be talking to the staff about this number and where we're at right now. No, I, 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 did, I did, mean, did that already. You did that I already. think that was, no, no, I mean, as far as that number, we've right. not um, gone yeah. there. But I, I'm happy to share that information. Well, we need to share that information. Yeah. We need to yeah. share that information. Work is going to share it one way or another. Yeah, no, I'm, so, I'm just saying, you know, it's just, um, it does and provoke anxiety. And I, I want us to be clear on kind of how we're thinking about it. That's all. Um, so. what would, are there any, um, like, computer replacement things that are, that, that, um, are up this year. Um, so we've kept the same budget for the technology for years. And it's an ongoing replacement It's an ongoing model. replacement cycle that's spread over five to six years of life. I mean, we have some things that are eight to ten years and then some right. that are three, but it averages about five, and Keith was just working with you on that. Is it, is it something that can be put on for you? What, I mean, well, I think what we need to cons I think it's... Think of it more in the facilities realm, you know, like those replacement cycles work to keep you out of like a big bubble. Right. Um, could there perhaps be some trimming there also? Perhaps, you know, but I want to look, there's several um, things infrastructure wise that we're making sure are up to date, like our phone systems and, you know, um, several of the uh, smart boards and projector systems that teachers use on a daily basis are due to be replaced mm -hmm. um, and are getting glitchy in some cases. So, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to um, be blind to that fact either. No, no, that's so. uh, And um, are there any um, systems or a personnel that you know are not going to be back next year? Um, or any? No, I mean, they don't have to declare that uh, yet. Okay. I think offering dialogue around that might be appropriate given our circumstance. Okay. Um, so is I, that what the board is feeling? Um, I, you know, I would not want to affect personnel um, right now um, and see any other uh, thing that we can do to um, get down to the uh, threshold, including. Um, I hate to say this actually, um, maybe um, reducing the capital fund by 30000 so down to sixty, which I think we did last year. I think we did it to down you to went 60. To, you, went, you went down to No, 30. we went from we 120 to 90 To 90 last year. Yeah. How about the year before that? No, we were at 120. We didn't with one. So, um, I think. It it's right here. It's 120. It's right in your budget. It's right in your budget. It was 120 and actual for 2018. For this budget year, it's 2000. It's 90, and it's in this current in the budget for 2020. It's 90. It's 90. Okay. Um, so I would, I would like to see what what can be trimmed aside outside personnel at this point. 
Um, so I'm gonna so probably bring, we'll probably be bringing you like a forty thousand, a sixty thousand dollar problem. Okay, better than a hundred and three. Okay. No, I think he's saying we have you have a sixty thousand dollar. I, I mean, we might be able to. We, we, we know, we know. If you trim thirty off of that, yeah. you're you're shorting for later on, yeah. um, and you're probably going to have a six. You know, probably we can get another ten to fifteen thousand dollars out of the budget max. Yeah, yeah really, Chris. I think it's are pretty there fixed. things that we offer at Romney that are not offered at other elementary schools in terms of educational experiences? Um, elementary principals are in the process of doing time study comparisons. So. What are their programs? That is one. So Spanish? Yeah, so you're the only school with Spanish. And we have Spanish for what grades? Sorry that I don't know. It's K-6. Yeah. And what does Dodi have? We had for a while, we had a point two Spanish teacher. Couple of years ago, I don't know the exact time frame, but we two, two years ago, ago. Uh, we um, scaled that down to um, paying some money each year to access uh, an online program for instruction in Spanish. Uh, this year, we we got some data that showed that it's just really not working very well for kids, and so we thought rather than spend it's only ten thousand dollars, rather than spend that on on that, it wasn't really doing. So I just I want to be clear that I am not like overly excited about staff cuts. I just it's a big hole to fill, and like Bill's saying, I mean I, I just I'm not seeing a ton of other stuff that won't impact. I mean I guess students um, and some and just. Where we're gonna where we're gonna put us if we if you say take a hundred thousand out of non staff, somehow pretty much we're gonna get us where the community didn't want us to go to supporting this facility. That's well, where that, the money that's, is. That's that's that I think that was the historical uh, decision. Mm -hmm. uh, is when when in doubt, you know, so cut, cut capital it? cut the capital fund and that. I mean, this is uh, since my engagement. Uh, with the board when I was doing what Chris is doing over there and then on the board is that when we run up into this issue when the board has run up into this issue that's the first place that's always sort of gone to um, it seems to be or one of the key places that's gone to mm -hmm. to save a chunk of money um, and well, well, to, to, well, but to save other to save personnel. Let's say yes. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but does it just kick the can down the road? It might. Uh, but you know, the one point where the projection was that it was going to be like 110 students. I think when um, one of our principals said a projection out of 110 students, which just didn't come to pass. Uh, and even I think the 127 that's projected for next year, um, that probably won't come to pass given the numbers that we have right now. Um, so I think that's three years from now. I think 2027. Two, two years from now, right? I thought it was 2021. No, that's 2021. Next year's 1921, 141. I don't expect that will come to pass, the 127. So Wait, what are you saying? You don't get worked through that low? Yeah. We're at 143 now. I understand, but we have bubbles. And we still do. What? I don't, do we have a bubble of students? Well, they're pretty, I mean, we have 20 leaving, 18 coming, so it's a deficit of two. Do we have any other significant bubble of students that are in six, population? Sixth grade is pretty full. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms uh, of numbers, I'd, I'd numbers. have to look it up. Okay. Quite it's it's range, but it's been between 24 and 27. I mean, I think the bubbles have been like 25, 20. I want to say it's 24, but I'd have to double check. Okay. So, I, I mean, wouldn't necessarily so call that a bubble I, in a small school. So, so, so well, I, it's like a range. Right. So, I mean, 
you're facing the same thing Cal started to race face two years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's it's that it's the slow decline, and you, you know it, you're going to get into talking about personnel somewhere along this path, and you know they're talking they're having to reduce a teacher. Probably they're looking at that next Thursday night. Mm -hmm. Another reduction of the teacher. They reduced one last year, just because of the slow numbers and the way the formula works for threshold and that. I don't like cutting personnel. It's after telling a student you can't come to school, telling an adult that you don't have a job is probably my second least favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something I want to do. Um, but it is also the pieces of the budget. So it's back. You know, it's back again. You know, with Caroline asking about Spanish, you and it's back to your values. Do you want to be all things for everything, or are there some core things that you want? Are there other elementary schools in RSU that offer Spanish K-6? No. Do they offer Spanish at all? No, they don't offer Spanish at all. So what do or any students... foreign language. No foreign <laughs> language. What do Rumney 7th graders do? They go into they go into middle levels. If they choose to stay in Spanish, they go into the middle level, the seventh grade Spanish. And that was happening before when we had Spanish across the system. The teachers at U thirty two were saying it wasn't. Not everybody was able to get. They just they just said it. They really just started again from scratch. So yeah. So I'm gonna say so when you say mid level, I think like, it was Spanish one, like, and, and it wasn't it, was, it wasn't making able exactly. to let you go to like a Spanish two. They, they went right. Everybody went to Spanish one. That's been that's been the history since the elementary Spanish program was created back in the mid two thousands, and that the U thirty two teachers are saying it just it was a nice exposure, but it, they started right again at the beginning of Spanish. Is that because they, there's not enough exposure during? Basically, is it one of those issues where we're not giving them enough? Is it so a one I, could, I couldn't stir. I could I couldn't speak to that. Yeah, I can tell you because we were gone actually for the seventh grade year, was in seventh grade year, and he learned four verbs and was able to go right into the eighth grade Spanish. So for him, it was it was totally sufficient to skip that first year. Now the policy has been to put everybody in the Spanish language, but there's been no testing now. So the policy without differentiation. Without differentiation. But there's other values to elementary it's Spanish cool. than right. Yeah, I think there's a lot of values for. But I'm just. Um, Can I ask what the number is? What number? For a Spanish teacher. Yeah, right. So for a, for, for a teacher. Right now, no. Yeah. Salary and benefits. Yeah. Average, average, right? Right? I don't think it's full time. I, I don't, oh, it's not full time? I, no. 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 Oh, okay. I don't believe so. Point five. Point five. Point five. So, okay, so do you do a point five so times 75. Yeah, or something. yeah so 37. Five. I mean, I'm just doing the average. I don't know okay. what, what Jen makes. I don't have that with me. I usually don't like to carry that stuff around. What? I usually don't like to carry personnel's total costs. Like a, a person oh, okay. attached to a person, I like to talk. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk about yeah, the yeah. average. Exactly. Carefully. I think it's a little, maybe I'll use my daughter's word, rude. Yeah. Um, Let's also remember and to not bring names into the conversation. Well, I wouldn't have been a name, but well, there's only so I, 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 We all know you know. I, 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 know, I, I, I know, yeah. Know, but. I actually don't know. <laughs> so well, okay. My kid doesn't do it very okay. much. But, um. Please. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I just have a quick question from my own position of ignorance, since you seem to all already know this. But what's the. So there's this threshold. What's the consequence of exceeding the threshold? For every dollar that you have to raise over the threshold, you have to raise another dollar for the Vermont Ed Fund in taxes in your in your town. And it was, I don't want to get political, but I also kind of want to know the value of it. It started to help kind of schools know where they were in terms of spending and have a goal to be better at their no it was really a meant a way to push down the rising cost of education i mean that's the way all of us as superintendents yeah, look at it it was, it was a penalty it was called a penalty formula so on the 
But it didn't yeah. work. So to the, ex so to the extent that yeah. if we level fund, we're at 100000 over was kind of... Not level of funding, we do level services. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted, my right, right. definition okay, of level right, funding right. means yeah, sure, same sure. dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. So, But if we say we're going to put everything in the school that's needed for kids... for The, the same way we did. The same way we did this year, we're $103,000 over. Okay, that. that's where I got that number from. But that means that we would have to raise 200000 206000 yeah. And based on our grand list, that would be... You'd be an extra, on our tax rate no, it's an extra, more. extra, almost four cents on your tax rate that you'd be doing for that extra hundred and six thousand dollars you'd have to raise. Not for the two hundred six, for the extra hundred and six would the, be the four cents. And you the know, additional one hundred three oh, doesn't come into our school. The That's money? the piece right. for me that, like, goes back it's not like it's coming money. here and helping. That would be much of a disincentive if it's Sure, it would. I mean, a little. Oh, right. You'd still pay more in taxes, but. <laughs> that would actually, I'm talking about a nightmare. You know, what would you Because if they don't double this, <laughs> it's yeah. in the future. It would go in the principal discretionary fund. Um, okay, so. Um, what do you, what do you gonna, want us to come back for a target? Let me ask you the issue. I would say a uh, budget. From, from my perspective, a budget that does not put us in the penalty zone. I was going to come up with three, but now I forgot them. The three kind of options, penalty, staff reduction, and I felt like there was a third. Oh, capital funds. Mm -hmm. And just talk about where our priorities were on that. Would that be at all helpful or no? Yeah, would How would you rank them? Uh, in terms of ranking? Um, I, I, in terms of reducing, I would, uh, I think, I would want to see what did the least fund. Um, and I do, I do think the capital fund, um, even, we've kind of made a, we've made a commitment to our community, not kind of, we made a commitment to our community, I think, to, Avoid any future bonding to, to the extent we can. Um, and um, I think we should keep that commitment as much as we can. Uh, but then we get into the um, situation of our, our mission is also to serve students, our students as best we can. Um, and if we end up getting into this penalty situation with community that revolts and say, what are you doing in a penalty situation when the vote down the budget that doesn't do very much for serving students. Um, I guess maybe to then then make the adjustments, the hard adjustments, and see if the community has a challenge for being in the penalty zone. Um, but it's just, it's a, for me, it's a situation doing the least harm uh, possible and but getting maximum benefit for students. And, and I know that's vague and Yes, yeah, so what, blah, blah, blah. I think everyone would say that. Um, but uh, for me, I probably want to cut personnel less, uh, last, I think, as a last resort. Uh, uh, because I don't think we're overstaffed at the moment now. Uh, anyway, for, for what we provide our students, is, is that a fair statement? If we were. That we're not overstaffed? In um, we are not, I, I will say, and again, it's not like trying to make apples to apples, yep. but we were staffed differently than all, I would say the other elementary schools is what I'm being told. Um, just looking at how we can figure things. Okay. Is our so, staffing structure as it's currently constituted um, serving our kids in the best way in terms of um, achievement and uh, educational opportunity. I would like time to examine this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I would, I appreciate you speaking to like, please do this last. Mm -hmm. um, I'm totally open to like working through those those aspects, and I appreciate everybody thinking through some of the low hanging fruit. Yeah, no, I don't understand how we're staffed differently than other schools. Can you say more about that? What that looks like? Can, uh, can, can I take you? Can I take you for saying? Can I say? I'm gonna say yeah. Parish. There was more parish. You have a lot more paras okay. than every other elementary school. Okay. You you're really staffed heavily. Classroom paras or no. paras from that are part of an IEP. Yeah, both. 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 
Do we oh. have paras that are not in a student's IEP? So regular ed paras. No. Yeah. yeah I thought every okay. I thought every one of our paras was. But you you have you have a lot. One of the things that I have tried to educate the boards in Washington in Washington Central about is there's been this belief that the IEP process <coughs> drives the paras, and that's not true. Can you explain? Yeah. Because the way a IEP processes, you can it's up to the school, not the IEP team, on how services are delivered. Not what the services should be, but how they're delivered. Do other schools have a student support person, other elementary schools? What do you mean? A student uh, student support. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're actually trying to get one into Calus right now. That's what we're going to go for. And the have they had them the last one. longer than Rumney? Yes. So it's possible that... Um, they were able to reduce their need no, for the, the, what's, hap what's happening is we're seeing student need escalate around the state and we're seeing it in Washington Central. I don't want to say that. It's, it's the way in which the work is done to provide the services. I'm being really direct. I know it's not popular. I know I'm not. I met with the parents last week. They didn't like when I was being direct with them about, I'm telling you what research is showing, I'm not saying what Nate Levinson says, I'm telling you what the Fordham Foundation is saying, what UVM is saying, what Act 173, the new law that came around for spending, spending for special ed, special ed is going to be pushing towards us. We're going to have lower and lower supports for special education because of block, block grant funding coming starting next year in FY21. So, so, I mean, so what is just, it that you were saying? Just it, it where that configuration, the configuration difference is in the number of paras. When we, you that's how this started. And, and so our paras aren't more attached to special ed students, that's not paid for out of the SU budget for special ed? No, it's paid out that's why I was pointing to you on this sheet it's of paper. It's paid out of your budget here at Romney. And so that's the two hundred and thirty six thousand? Yeah. Time. The special educators are paid out of the SU, not the parent. Okay, so I think a one on one who is with a special ed student is paid for by our budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're our employee, okay. not an SU employee. Got it. That is a key decision. Okay, mm -hmm. so if there was an overage, for example, the paras, mm -hmm. does that change where you would rank a reduction? Um, I would want to know with the IEPs as written, are they ever written that the student will have a one on one? Sometimes they are. Okay, so then, then that person cannot be reduced. Then. Not that's necessarily. See, that's what I'm. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, so if it's part of the plan, how do you get away from that? Then you can have another meeting yeah. to reduce services. Well, I'm just saying, if you, you it's can part of the plan already, yeah. can you just not provide that aspect of the plan, or you say we're going to achieve that goal some other way? Exactly. Okay, but then. Yeah. The goal of one-on-one? -on -one? No, the student, no, you don't the call goal, for the one-on-one. Okay, right, yeah. right. you're, you're providing the services another way. Mm -hmm. um, can, can you do a real... Uh, I, need Kelly, I, I need to Kelly here, because we've been doing this in other schools. I mean, one thing I will say is that the teachers were so clear. I was going to say that same yeah. thing. Yeah. Don't take and it makes care. sense, you know, like if you cut a kindergarten class and somebody's got a bloody nose and you have to do instruction, you can't do it without the pair there. I, 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 I understand the issue. I understand the issue, Roden. I'm just trying to get, it's the, this is the tough decisions when we're in the budget place we're in. But I think it helps us to know that piece in terms of where our priorities are versus mm -hmm. the like sad in the dark. Okay, so do you want to rent first? What? Can you clarify what you're saying? So I'm <laughs> saying, uh, can you say it again? Because I was going to actually write it out where we were. So capital fund In terms of reduction. It, well, let's just say that we agreed. Forget about how it was determined. If we agreed there was a little bit of an overage in staffing, that's, that's what the reduction would do, would be to not be over. And then um, going past the threshold. So which would be your... They're all terrible. Yeah. Which would be your, right. like, what would you do first? What um, would you do um, second? What would you do third? Okay, so capital budget would be first to me. Okay. Um, 
Can I clarify your comfort zone on that? Yeah, I would go, to, I would go to, to 60, I would fund it with 60,000 dollars. Which would bring our, it's it down reduce 30. Reduce it 30, right. Um, but down 60 from Matt's recommendation. Yep. Yeah. Um, and um, I would have staff induction last. Okay, thank you. What was the other option? I forgot it, Caroline. Uh, capital it. fund reduction and then being over the threshold. Oh, capital fund reduction? No. We're paying, capital we're paying, fund. paying over. The paying over. Oh, the, the penalty. Yep. And then reduction in staffing. Right. Okay, so I, yes. And then the threshold. Priority. Say, say it again. Well, what do you mean by this? So no, it's one, pay. three, two. So first. I would say reduce capital fund. I would, then I would go to the penalty. So um, you would, okay. Penalty. Yeah. Yes. And then um, reduce that. Woden? Um, come back to me. Um, for me, I would say capital fund first. I, I would probably say, tw I was going to say 20, but I'll say 30, so Chris and I are the same. Um, that puts the threshold at 80. I would want... I guess I would do a reduction next if it was about over an area where we thought we could um, reduce and still provide quality education and then threshold would be third. I wouldn't want the threshold um, over 30 so that it, I think it does stand out if we're the highest over. So that's where my priorities would be. Um, I agree starting with capital, but I just don't see the capital getting as close to there. And I, I am hesitant to go to 30. Okay. Um, uh, um, I would just, uh, I don't know if I can put a number on it like that, but it's hard because 90 is already low. It, it would have been much better if it was 120. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and I would also, I would encourage, uh, you know, nickel and diming too with, uh, you know, I know Bill, you've said on more than one occasion, we'll find it in the budget. And like, this is the time to find it in the budget. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, honestly, I think about like something like four wins uh, that we provide awesome program but and I don't know how it's currently functioning but I know in the past because it's volunteer driven we've had classes that have had it because they've had volunteers and we've had classes that haven't because they had but they haven't had because they haven't had volunteers to do it but no matter what we're paying a flat fee to access that service even and if we don't access it? Even if not all the students have access to it, because oh, okay. if we don't have the volunteers okay. available to teach it. <laughs> I think it's $2,000 $2, or something. Yeah, you might say it's okay. So it's not, it's not substantial, but that, but I mean, it's like, that's what I mean by nickel and diamond. Like, um, Sometimes it's the little things. Yeah. It is, I, I would say, t from my perspective, you know, based on that model, I would say that's less of a priority than other opportunities. But again, that's sort of, we're talking small change compared to what we're trying to eat away at. Did you want to rank the other two? Oh, I thought I did. Sorry. Um, I so, capital fund is one, oh, but that's a lesser For, amount. Yeah, then, then um, staffing. And then and the threshold. threshold. Um, I guess I would, I'm going to go still looking at the capital fund. Makes me nervous. Um, I think uh, I, I, I like the way you frame things, Brian, in terms of nickel and diming. It seems to me that there probably is, you know, at least twenty thousand dollars that we can find in this budget. Maybe we don't spend money on, you know, for some reason we spent twenty three thousand on, uh, or almost twenty four thousand dollars on books and periodicals this year. I know ten thousand of that was a book that we had done. Um, you know, but but going through, I think that there probably is money in a lot of those places that will add up. 
some. So that I'm wouldn't be this budget. That. We voted. No, I understand. You know, and this, and it's now down to four for the, for the coming, but the, that sort of, um, you know, that those places um, I would look at, I think we can probably do okay. fine for a year. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me finish. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, and then I would um, look at any place where you feel like we can reduce staff without um, causing um, morale issues or um, in services to the kids. Um, and then I guess I, I, I would like to keep us as little over as possible. Yeah. Um, sorry, you just, you reminded me of that, um, of that decision based on excess funds. And I'm just, I'm thinking proactively, I don't, I'm not finding it in here quickly, where we're, where we're at and if it makes sense. Uh, so where I'm going with all this um, roundabout way is um, if we have comfort in our um, in our reserve funds, are there things that we could potentially allocate funding for now that are currently being projected as fixed as costs in the next so, budget? So wait, so what happens is is you make a whole make a double or double the whole for the budget after that. Because it's one time money. It's Talk one time one money. Time. So you want you know you can take fund balance and pay for one time things. There's things that only occur no, like I'm once every ten years. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that's an annualized cost, no, you I'm make a about, double whole. Yeah. So like the books that you did last year on top was a nice thing to help with some classroom libraries. Mm -hmm. They should get refreshed a little bit every year, but we needed a major refreshment, as I recall, from last spring of some of our classroom libraries. Yeah, so I guess what I'm asking is that not that it would be an ongoing cost, but are there things in the budget that are one time? There's very deal. few of those because we've tried to annualize those costs, just like we talked about with technology. We mm -hmm. know the replacement cycle, yeah. so we try to do that so we mm -hmm. don't have the peaks and valleys as much. And, and we do have a commitment of probably 65000 for the boiler? Not yet. We're about to go I on mean, with the RFP. That's, We're yeah. I mean, you know, by by February, I'll be back here saying, right. I "Need you to sign this contract or tell me to reject the bids because right. we're going so to replace that boiler." Like, yeah, it's, that's, that's kind of like the one-time one. Time one. Even yeah, we, it wasn't whether from that capital or budget. Fund yeah. right. But this, for example, we've got thirty-nine thousand in here for tuition to private schools, and my understanding is that that may not be an expense. Um, two or three years from now. Because, I mean, we can't obviously count on it, I but can't. are we expecting that that will be an expense? Has that been an expense in the past? Um, it fluctuates depending on student need. And that one we feel pretty solid about, so. Oh, no, here, absolutely needs yeah. to be in here, but I'm just thinking in terms of what Ryan's suggesting. Yeah. You know, there are potentially places where, yes, it causes a double hole, but we may be able to find a place where that, where we can reasonably anticipate not spending 40000 dollars um, First of all, Caroline, I want to thank you for asking that question because that helps what you did. All the board. Um, it almost seems that if we want more information on that, we have to be in the executive session. And I, we, I don't have that tonight. What? Oh, okay. So we didn't come. No, but First I think she's just saying there are typically yeah. in a K 6 period, is there one or two students that gets funded to? An alternative school, or is it an anomaly? Right? Yeah, yeah. thank and you. <laughs> and, and how long will that, is it anticipated to last? That I think might get into then what grade the kid is yeah. in. Well, that that's, why, that's why I said it's a session. Oh, we gotcha. gotcha. Okay, right. okay, now I understand right. where you're going. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, thank you. Is that helpful? That's yeah. helpful. Yeah. We'll take it from there. Um, no, we've been here for two hours. Sorry. <laughs> really? It's, oh my. You said 90 minutes. I like that. I knew this was going. I was going to talk to you. Yeah, I'm like. I knew this was going to be the hard. This is going to be the hard one. Do you want to take a break? As soon as I have to do this. Anyway, and then we just uh, and then we'll kind of reorder what we need to do with the sick partners. Sure. It was very hard to do, but just so we move on. And um, what are we going to move on to the agenda? So we're going to talk about F36 now. Um, and there are a couple of different things that we need to address. Brandon Lipfield talked about the um, timing of various 
meetings and votes that a lot are of things. coming up? A lot of things. Um, if I'd like advice, some of these are decisions that I make, but I don't want to do them in a vacuum. Um, I, hopefully all of you had a chance to read the memo I sent out today. I want to, uh, and I put it on front porch form as well, apologizing to the folks that we had to rewarn the district organizing meeting for the transition board from the 9th to the 14th. Um, there were some conflicting statutes and we read them and I decided after advice to go conservatively and rewarn the meeting. So it's been moved to the 14th from the 9th of January. And that should reflect here on the schedule for the organizational meeting that I, hit, that I passed out. The other thing that's a change that we I found out on Tuesday from Chris Leopold, who's our attorney helping us with Act 49, is that, as you know, there's a subcommittee that the SU board put together to start to look at the draft articles. You have an action item, action item number 5.9, recommend membership for Act 49 committee. That needs to be done proportionally, so there's proportionality based on equalized pupils. It's basically the same membership we had for the 706B committee, which had three members from East Montpelier and from Berlin each. Callis and Middlesex had two members, and Worcester had one member. Um, so we need, I, if you remember, for those of you that were at the Supervisor Union Board meeting, I was trying to um, have us be allowed to have six oh, individuals yeah. only, and that's what's on the current committee. But we only need this committee to have one or two meetings, and they have to host a hearing of the public to react to the articles. Um, but that mm -hmm. means that you'll need to appoint two members tonight. Um, These are the responsible for drafting the articles? Well, I think a lot of the drafting has been done, done. by the subcommittee, but yeah, they'll right. review them and then have a hearing on them and then okay. have a final proposal to go to the voters. They're responsible for that, maybe is the best way to say it to give you a reality. Okay. In statute, they said this, it would say they're responsible for drafting the articles. But we have the group of six that's been the subcommittee doing a lot of that heavy lifting right now. And you proposed for January now. Right, yeah, I'm planning to have, I'd like to have what I'm thinking about right now, and I haven't had a chance to talk to the subcommittee members. So for two of them sitting in the room, Matt and Chris, it's the first time they've heard this from me. Um, I'm trying to have a meeting of that that committee somewhere either January 2nd or 9th so they have a chance to work as a committee a little bit before the hearing that for, especially for the new folks to ask the folks that were there drafting them so why'd you draft it this way or why'd you change it that way and then have a hearing with the public on the 9th and there'll need to be a third meeting for them to take any of the feedback they have from the public and if they want to incorporate it how they might change the article mm -hmm. and they have to be done so they have to go back through Chris Leopold if we change them substantially I bet to be reviewed by our attorney to be then presented to the voters and there has to be a warning as you see on here by January 19th to hit a vote date of February 19th which the subcommittee and I talked about it'd be best to have a vote the Tuesday before school vacation which right. is our last possible Tuesday we could I checked with the town clerks today they're willing to run an election on a different day other than a Tuesday in Vermont, it's always been tradition that elections are on Tuesdays. So we could gain a few days here and there, but not more than probably three or four. Okay. So that's the update on the articles. Um, I have a, after just our discussion and budget, and I'm, um, I'm having, uh, I, I have the intent from the board that you'd like to have another meeting to talk about budget, bring it back to you and have another way in before it goes to the transition board. Um, I am trying to plan this both ways, so if there is a merge budget, what's to do, and then if it's not a merge budget. I will tell you that if we do not merge and we become in, you know, there's a stay or there's an injunction from the court, we will not be able to hit town meeting at this point to vote a budget. We are that far down the road and off the track that we cannot be ready, and the reason is we can't, we're already changing inside the fiscal system to have reports ready for town report. And so town report, we have to have everything ready to go on January 10th for the town report for budget wise. The warnings you usually adopt before Martin Luther King Day. So we will not be able, we would have to have a special election sometime after town meeting day, even if we were six separate districts. 
So we're at that point already where we can't hit town meeting day. This is for budget approval and yeah. electing officers? No, for budget approval if we were six separate districts. We're already changing the system because we have to change the system to meet the deadlines that we have and to the new fiscal software requirement that we have. We have to chart, we have to build two different fiscal software systems right now because the Senate in Act 11 and then passed and adopted required that all schools be in a new fiscal software on July 1st, 2019. So it's not just because of the Act 49, what we usually do. We have so much fiscal work we have to do. We have to change the whole coding system and be in that new fiscal software by July 1st, 2019. So is there... I don't have the fiscal personnel is what I'm telling <clears throat> you to do this. Okay. And it's really, I don't have one person. You, I need like you, three Lori Bebos. Are you going to even print out a budget, individual budget for each school then? Or? So, Chris, it's not about printing it out. It's about putting it all together. Mm -hmm. We do all this in Excel. We use very antiquated software. Most, Some other places don't, but in Washington Central, we stayed with Nemric for years, so all our budget development, when you look at what was in your packet, that's all written in Excel. Mm -hmm. So it's... It, you can go through how might you change your processes, but I can tell you, Lori has told me, we've had this, we spent two hours in my office on Monday looking at processes and timelines and milestones to meet, and she's like, Bill, I can't stop, i got to go one way or the other right now. And I said, so that means what I'm hearing is, if we have an injunction, we're in six districts, we have to, we will not be electing, a, a, won't be putting a budget to vote, because the warning has to go out, mm -hmm. Um, somewhere after uh, the week of Martin Luther King. Okay, so, so you know it's not town meeting day is the day. Right. You got to back all the way up into January. Right. Okay, so we just so it's just it, I don't think it's a big deal, but I want you to be informed that right. you, we would have another special. So election. Give us more time. Do we want to have another meeting? Or was it, no, no. So we, we, we have the transitional board. Is we have the transitional board has the responsibility to start putting together a budget to recommend to the new board. So I think you should have another meeting. You're, it's lucky that you're early in the month. Yeah. We, we are meeting next. I'm just looking on calendar with the 12th. It would be our next regular scheduled meeting, which would be two days before. Yeah. So I think for you to, I think that's an okay date. I want to look now, as I was telling Chris earlier, I, the, all today I've got this big calendar going on my table, all for those of you who've been in my office, that has like six months of things on it right now, all governance at 46 stuff. And so I think the 12th will be okay for you to come back together. I'll look at it by Friday if I think you need to come back together as a running board earlier. earlier, and I'll let you know. Okay. All right. I don't, because I think you, I, of all the six boards, I feel for Romney and having you tackle the questions we were just talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just to. Can I, can I finish about the town report? Because there's a couple other things sure. I need to know that are in this transitional board membership and the timeline for the local school, uh, school board meetings. I made a decision um, earlier this week, maybe end of last week, that the town report that's going into the town book um, will cover information that's on this current fiscal year and last fiscal year. The reason I say that is because you'll have a statement in there about your audits. You'll have things like your board chair and principal report, salary information for people that work here, the superintendent's report, and the independent auditor's report. If you look at one of these sheets right here, if you can kind of see, just get the idea of what's circled and what's not, mm -hmm. most of the rest of that, what's in the town report, is budget for the next year, what folks are voting on, or tax rates and how tax rates are calculated. So those will not be going in the town report. There will be a special report to present that to the voters, whether it's merged or not, but it just won't be in the town report. And that's one of the things we need to start communicating, is there's going to be changes to the town report right now not because we're not trying to get the information. We're just at a point where we can't get, we it, can't get it done. No, no, not can't get it done. We can't get it to them because we don't know which direction we're going. And while I'm, well, I'm working on the piece of, as I've said to you, as your superintendent and for my superintendent's license, I need to do as told by AOE. So I'm working down the path of merger, but I'm trying to have an easy off-ramp if there's an injunction as well. But I've got to stay on that by law to keep my license. I have to do as told by the Agency of Education. 
This is somewhat related, but not completely. Um, I'm just thinking about we. So we have um, two two positions on this board board that are um, coming up on their terms, and what happens to those seats? Are those seats just so? That's a good put. And I, the video I filmed a video last night, but I have to refilm it because the dates have changed since last night. So I'm refilming it tonight, which actually has a nice graphic that explains that the local boards have to stay in existence until December 30th, 2019. You are operationally in control of operations for this current year. You do no longer have responsibility or authority over FY20. So the new board has that right now. So with that, we need this board. What's the minimum this board has to do to stay <coughs> operational? I'm not saying you should do it, but no. approve no. approve the board orders and be available for any student or staff hearings if they were to happen. Discipline type through year. December, not through June, June. June. through June. June 30th. Okay, June 30th. You yeah. need yeah. one oh, meeting. Yeah. You need yeah. one yeah. meeting after <coughs> June 30th to do two things: to accept the auditor's report for this fiscal year and to dissolve your board. Okay. And if it goes beyond the articles as drafted right now of agreement, say if it goes beyond December 31st, 2019, that would be the responsibility of the new board. Some other boards have actually, <coughs> some other mergers have actually passed that responsibility on earlier, but that's just where we're so at. So we have two seats that are <coughs> and two people who are not running. And I, I, so then you would, yeah. the town would vote on two new people. You'll have votes March, on town meeting April, day. You'll have May, votes. June. Yep. You, for still, the would, you still would be voting. You have to. Yep. Yeah. Okay. What do you mean that folks think the board is going to go out of existence? They that None. think it could be right, but here you still have a quorum. So here's the thing: you have to have a quorum, and well, if you, you don't have a quorum, right? If you still have the quorum, then you're fine. If you don't have the quorum, then the select board appoints. There are some of our boards that don't aren't going to have a quorum, and if they don't get people to run. Um, <coughs> without having that quorum, the select board, except for U32, I'm not sure where it goes there, would appoint members to until they get to a quorum and then the board takes over. Yeah. So that's, I just wanted to make sure I <coughs> reviewed all that, Chris. I know that took a little long. Yeah. So I'm going <coughs> to propose that we vote on members to the uh, Articles Committee and also for the transition. Well, just so we get that out of the way. Yeah, and the people who and, want and to. Chris, just for your knowledge. Is, is, um, that's systemic, right? I mean, there's not much error in the. It's or, the current, that's the recommendation. But, but that can also be, that can be in, oh, yeah. anyone else. Okay. That was amended, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, you got it. I was just going to say, if, it, if you don't do it, if you table it, it in it my just, opinion, it just stays. It, it, it just right, stays the chair and the uh, clerk. clerk. Have we voted on it? We haven't voted on no, it yet, right? Yeah, yeah. No, but Chris is asking. And because Allison has said. New. I mean, I thought she had said she didn't feel like she would be a good transitional person because she was new, but it was not official. Like yeah, I'm kind of nervous voting on that. It's so important. I think we should um, put that off until. Are we yeah. Well, I don't Which know that we can. can. Yeah. First meeting uh, is not. I need you to really do. So, are there two people who want it? Basically. I do want. Well, let's let's do Act 46 first, and then we'll do yeah. the transitional. Yeah. 49. 49. Um, is it 49? Yeah. Okay. Membership for the Act 49. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm interested in continuing to serve on the articles. We're talking about the articles committee. Um, and we need two representatives from the town um, of Middlesex. So I'm interested in, in serving, continuing to serve. Is anyone else interested? I leave on February 4th, but it sounds to me like their job work will be done before that point. It will be done in January, I think. It better be, or we won't have a vote. <laughs> right, that's right. It's, it yeah, has to be so done. I you what? I mean, we need Any others? I would do it, but don't need to. I would also, I would do the transitional one as well, uh, or that rather than the articles. And you would do both? I would make an argument for the same people on articles and the transition board because they're going to really understand the issues in a different way. Okay. Um, well, then, so does that mean that, does that disqualify you then? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do it if nobody else wants to, if you want to, um, you can. 
I think Allison was interested in serving on the transitional board in my I'm willing to do it. And, um, if you would like to do the articles, you can. I uh, think, in terms of representing our community, um, Allison and Chris are probably the better choices for the commission board. Why? Why do you say that? Because you are minority um, opinion in terms of what you stand for. I don't know that our town has ever voted. Our town hasn't. It happened, but in, in terms of every sort of evidence we've seen, um, you know, and, and you've been surprised by that. You know, I've been surprised at the last election. So, Excuse um, me? you at the last election, I remember you standing over there and saying, "I was surprised by the results for the board." Um, um, which election? The the election for the for this current school board. So, who was up for? election. It was, I mean, Chris and Allison. I don't know how, yeah. I don't recall. Anyway, my, my point is that I think that we have somebody, you know, Middlesex um, has had a strong um, and fairly consistent, both in our, um, uh, you know, in the, in the meetings that we've had and in the, um, the, the survey, um, very clearly um, interested in keeping our own school district. And I don't, um, that's not a position we represent. And so, I would say that you probably have the best person. Um, so, I really appreciate your perspective. So I would, if if we'll take that argument, uh, and uh, I would then say, does that mean that folks in this community that are in support of the merge process don't have a voice? No, of course they do. I mean, but the, but the question is, what's the um, uh, you know if if we're going to have two people on this transition board? Um, I, I, uh, there has been relatively little vocalized support for, for where you are to the point of it. Um, it's, it's been overwhelming um, in terms of Middlesex people wanting to maintain their school board. And so for you to be 50% of that representation, it is, you know, it's not personal, right? It's just what you, um, I, you know, it, it's, it's, you have been very consistent and you were the one person in, of all the school boards, um, you know, not to support the, uh, alternative proposal and it's a minority position and it, it just doesn't feel like it would do a good job representing it. I disagree, but that's fine. Um, if I could offer a quick, actually, um, so I am somebody who is opposed, I support the lawsuit and all, but I actually think Brian would be good on that position if the goal is to make it transitional and this is the representation we're going to end up with, I would think that we want somebody that was in favor with that particular organizational structure to help represent Middlesex's view. I don't see that as, as kind of contravening like what might be overall the rest of the way the town is pursuing this, this much. So I, I actually think that Brian's viewpoint would be useful on a transitional board because that if that's the structure we're going to end up with, somebody who's like, well, how can we make the best of the structure seems to be a good person to have there. I think that's true, David. I think that there are going to be those people from other towns. Yeah. Um, you know, for certain reasons, not clear, they much more supportive of that. And so, um, so it's really a question of waiting. I mean, but yes, absolutely. So I make a motion um, to nominate, is it a motion on nominations? Anyway, I nominate Chris and Brian for both the articles. Sure. And I think it's one at a time. I'm in the middle of my motion, though. Okay, I'm making a motion to do both. Chris and Brian for both. That's my motion if it needs to be amended. Okay, so I, accept um, I think because it's, it's two separate actions okay. um, that we should break them out. It's, it's two separate uh, motions. Um, and if, would you accept the friendly amendment? I do. Okay, so, so we'll do one. The amendment would be to do with the articles, articles first. first. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would need a second. Okay, so it's your motion just deals with the, with the articles. Articles, okay. and my motion, my nominees were Chris and Brian. I would second that. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, so now I make a second motion. Okay. For the transitional board, I nominate Brian and Chris. And I need a second. I second. And I would say my understanding is that Allison was interested in serving for I didn't hear anything about that one, so I'm not going to disagree with you. Okay, so, um, I 
Uh, any discussion? Because um, Alison did express interest in, in me and I as well. Yeah, I think we should wait until Alison's here next to um, for the vote. I would push you to just keep the chair and the clerk and let this happen, folks. And Alison's the clerk. And just, we need, I need to know as soon as possible. I can't be waiting to get things put together because I'm trying to get schedules put together. I, I really, I mean, I need to talk to the different people that are going to be there, say, can we go to this night? What's the night? We're going to be meeting weekly, almost weekly for some time, if not twice a week. I, I, the sooner, I really need to know, I need to know by the, you know, I'm waiting until next Thursday for the last board, and then I'm really trying to put all this together and trying to coordinate everything. I'm sorry to push you, but I think... Anybody um, willing to reconvene? Can come and ask can be here? I don't know. I feel like, I mean, one, it's a motion. If it's a tie, I would reconvene. I want to vote. Allison could have been here tonight. I think she was, uh, my memory is that she was talking about the transitional board because she hadn't been on this board long enough. Um, even if she was interested and even if she was here, my nominees would be the same. So I'd like a vote. Um, then I'm going to call the vote. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. So we'll be convening at a time when else, and when we're all about, um, okay. because it would not want it to be again on a full board. Um, uh, the interest of time is now 8.40. Um, Are there other items on this agenda that we absolutely have to do uh, tonight other than hear from um, our administrator on um, just principal report? I think um, it would be helpful to hear where the things are with the lawsuit and then also potential legislation. Is there legislation um, in different discussion about uh, there, extending the timeline? Uh, there's all sorts of legislation under discussion. Um, touching upon lots of scenarios and at this point it's too difficult to predict but I um, there will be legislation I think it's probably safe bet. Um, Does it make any sense what that's like the weapons um, that can fly or not? Is that how the support the state board? Or it's about too that? difficult to say. We've got 40 new members and people haven't yet been um, stacked into various committees and people haven't had a chance to be in the building together to do the meetings to iron out what that legislation could look like. So I hesitate to lead anyone astray. But I would say it's um, there will definitely be legislation. The question where it goes and what the support is remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. Um, in terms of any lawsuit, um, my understanding is that it is uh, Still being prepared has to be filed within 30 Sto days of Stowe Lamar South filed today. They filed today up in uh, Hyde Park. I don't know where they filed. I'm assuming it's in Hyde Park. I, I would assume it's in Hyde Park. To my knowledge, no other filing yet, uh, but there's a 30 day deadline from the date of the uh, state board action, which was the 28th. Uh, so I expect it would be within the next week or so. Um, just to not run into the timing problem. Um, any principal report? Um, actually, may I just sure. request? <laughs> um, I've had increased calls around building use, and oh, okay. um, I'm really needing the form updated uh, that kind of was overseen at um, central office, and I wanted to make sure um, that we get to that sooner rather than later, as well as. You know, um, I would appreciate uh, guidance on uh, kind of the parameters around the building use is, you know, it is becoming, I'm getting a lot of calls for, you know, um, hey, can we use the gym? And, you know, I, I don't want to be out there 
um, without guidance from you. So, okay, so um, I, I actually got a copy of the form and I'll make edits, proposed edits anyway. I'll send them around to them and then we'll um, take it up at our next meeting. Um, show me, we'll not, but not the, 19, the next meeting we're all together. Just to yeah, she'll need, uh, she'll need priorities for certain different types of groups. Okay. It's one of the things, Berlin is our building that probably gets the highest use, but the amount of calls that Amy's getting right now are getting close to that. And so we're very, you know, we talk about um, within the town that our student center, you know, they're for students that attend the school, outside the town students, you know, that, and I could give you that Berlin one, but it, when we start to get into nonprofits and to profits companies, there's usually a big shift there for cost. And right now, as I told you, Chris, the other day, um, it costs about $35 an hour for cleaning. And we have the, the time log it takes to clean every room or, you know, whatever division of this. But we need to charge that um, because Nate's, Nate and Pete and Connor, are, they're working their butts off and add more time. To them, it's over time, and they're gonna. We need to make sure that they're compensated for that. Okay, so probably our next meeting. Um, that would be great, and just parameters around priorities as far mm -hmm. as um, our students. Can you, uh, would a student need can, be? Can you sorry. can you ask Aaron for the Berlin? I, absolutely. Because Aaron's got that. Berlin's probably got the best because that building's right there on the interstate. People call all the time wanting to use it. Can I make a suggestion, though, that, uh, Amy, I'll ask you if this doesn't work for your schedule, is that um, I know, I understand we're having a, se a separate meeting to address the, um, the seats, but um, if this can potentially, if this can wait to be addressed until the 13th or the 12th when we meet next, is that, given that we're running into the holidays and all that, do you, do you foresee that that would be uh, just increased headache for you. Um, you know, one of them might be helpful to set the turn of the year when you open up the building again. You have, we have a, this is what the policy is. So that it's would a fresh be my, starting point. I mean, I think 12 days isn't the end of the world. You know, I do want specific guidance because, you know, just um, trying to plot rooms yeah. and preserve kind of. Um, emergency spaces for kids around practices that allow us to still have practice instead of having to call parents for plan B's because we have no place to put them in a thunderstorm or you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, the building has heavy use until about six o'clock mm -hmm. and so and then after that you know Connor's working around the building and so um, yeah, I mean, and I'm not here to direct, welcome to Rumney, you know, kind of thing, um, at the times that many people would be perhaps looking to convene. So, um, the anyways. reason The reason why I raised that, I'm just thinking of trying to pull us all together for a five to 10 minute meeting versus a 30 mm -hmm. minute or beyond, I think is given just the time of the year is going to be, so be I challenging. Think the, actually, the update on the form, if we can move forward with that, would like to be using current stuff um, as soon as possible is what I'm saying. I mean, at this point, quite honestly, the availability for um, various areas between basketball and, um, you know, other practices and CC and, you know, the other community groups, we're already pretty pretty busy. So, um, anyway. Does the form require board no, it action? Does not. It does not. But, you know, I'm going to make proposed changes just to send it out one way communication. Um, and so it's not a unilateral change. And, and, and along also with Amy, your input on whether you can work with any of the proposed changes and or propose other ones to the form. But I'll, I'll get that to you by next week. Okay. okay. Um, any any other um, report? I no. yeah, I think what I have to say okay. is enough. Um, go from your end. Um, I gave you my report. I was going to tell you things you need to do on this agenda. Okay. Before you left. 
you need to do uh, five three five four. Um, we'd like you to do five one because right now we're doing. We, we'd like you to rescind those policies. We have two pol sets of policies on the books. Okay. Um, I don't think any of those will come up, but it's good to have them that cleaned up. You need to do five five. Okay. And I'm just going down and reading right okay. now. Um, I think Matthew would like you to do five eight, but that could wait. And then um, with the work we did at the SU, and then the rest can you talk? You did the forty nine committee. So. What's five ten resolution on running education goals? Is that not the guarantee? No, it's not the guarantee. It was um, just what is the just to establish what is Romney's um, overall vision, the board's overall vision on education goals, and what part of the whole teaching the whole child is part of it. Do we have um, we a proposal in here? No. Nothing, no document? Right. So we'll do that and we'll address that next meeting. Um, can, can, what's oh, the, it goes what's with 3.1? Like that's the yes. discussion in 510 yes, is the action? That okay. <laughs> Um, so what is the um, retirement opt-out for teachers? It's one that you were supposed to do back in October that's mm -hmm. been tabled, that you're required through your master agreement with your teachers that you will either uh -huh, okay. take off of retirement, off retirement oh, okay. and, and I usually suggest and have strongly since I've been here, <coughs> that once okay. the board's voted to do it, but that you make the motion in the affirmative as all motions should be, and that my recommendation is that you don't offer it so that you turn down the motion. Okay. But your master agreement requires that you do it. You do it again. Okay. You do it again. To consider. Yes, okay. you have to consider it, and you're supposed to have done it by November 1st. Okay. So it's just kept rolling on your agenda. So is um, anyone willing to make a motion on uh, 5.3 regarding the um, retirement opt-out for teachers? I move we approve the retirement opt out for teachers. Um, I'll second. second. Um, but I don't understand who it is. There's a clause in the master agreement that you can offer a buyout for a teacher if they would like to retire. Okay. And it's something that is co actually cost us more. Can you give me, can you explain that? It's because you have to pay benefits for that teacher as well as over three years you pay a half their salary each year you can't set it that it's solely you can't set it at whatever you want it's in it's, it's in, in the, the budget what it is it's, it's in the agreement of what it is okay so can you tell me what it is in the agreement 50 percent 50 percent spread over three years plus benefits for the old. we understand what you're doing we understand why the boards are saying no but you please make sure they say no to us and i said sure i mean they didn't say it that way but I'm being a little facetious. If we wanted <coughs> to throw out an alternative, like 30 percent, no, we can't do that. That's we would not be allowed to do that. It's a negotiated item, and the board can't treat nope. Romney staff separate. Nope. Okay, we just not do that. Trying to cover all, but if during negotiations the teachers saw that everybody had voted it down and decided on their own to come up with one that was a little more, like maybe people would say yes, they could do that at negotiations this year. Yes, they might. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so there's a motion pending. Um, all in favor, say aye. All opposed, say nay. Nay. And thank you. We have a resignation of point two nurse. Okay. Um, it's on page 50. Has it been filled? No. That not, I believe, right? We've been doing and it with that's a not something We've been doing with a substitute nurse. That's... It's going to be hard. We couldn't go to a point eight nurse. <coughs> So um, we're in a, or we have the position posted. So we need to accept the resignation of um, Ms. Warder mm -hmm. um, uh, from the point two nursing position. Um, is there a second? Second. second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 The audit report was emailed to you. There weren't any recommendations or findings. There were some suggestions that we put in place right after Ron was here. He'll be back in February to talk to you about any more details that you'd like to you know, hey, ask. Anything that you can show in your report? 
I haven't read it for like two months, Chris, so I don't remember. If there was, I probably would. would. Probably heard about it yeah. Okay. And I trust Laurie. Okay. Is there a motion to accept the audit report? I move to accept the audit report. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Now we're going to uh, 5.1, assuming no new policies. I have not had a chance to check these against the SU ones. Has anybody? No. Yeah, we this already has been voted on. to approve these these at the SU level. Um, but I, I, yeah, that was months ago now. Um, that, so I don't recall any discrepancies. Um, so we have. Um, Policy number uh, C2, which is the uh, bylaws. Uh, C3, which is the procedures for board of director meetings. So, board, well, you're on this committee. So, when you do you when you guys make these sort of these um, recommendations to adopt SU wide board rules, are you looking at how they might conflict or um, how they work with Yeah, I, I can tell you this meeting is not less than any committee I've ever been on. It's um, There's sort of structural problems um, that I think are fixed now, right? Do we have a new representative? From where? Uh, there was, there was a, someone who just didn't come. Right, but we still, we, so still, we still had those meetings then. Still, yeah, no, no. Um, and so what happens is it's very difficult to get a quorum, and we had a couple of meetings that people couldn't make, so we have not um, had yeah, these were done. Meeting. These were done the end of last year. At the end of last year, so and I was not on it at that point. Yes, you were. You've been okay. on it since March. I've been to three meetings. I understand that. You, 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 you haven't been there much, but these were, these went I've through. <laughs> we don't meet very often. But, um, so Brian, in, in terms of your question of do we actually sit down and compare Here's what one of these policy says, and here's what the proposed policy is. No, we do not. Um, so I would like to, I feel uncomfortable uh, rescinding our policies until I personally have done that. Um, if you all decide to do that, I'll probably abstain. I didn't meant to do that before today. Um, will you, okay, so what I'm, um, can I make a motion? You can make a motion. I move to rescind our new policies, C2 bylaws, C3 procedures, reporter directors meetings, D1 personnel recruitment, selection, appointment, and background checks, D10 public complaints about personnel. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, can you discussion? So, uh, I think the one thing I would say just is an important one. Yeah. To, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, if Brian hadn't made his motion, I was going to at least do D1 because the background check, you really can't have two policies on that running simultaneously. I would want it to be really clear what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that one is important. And I just, just say for the minutes that I um, don't feel that at least I can responsibly rescind policies when I haven't looked at what we currently haven't made a comparison. And would I, uh, um, I'm happy to do that for the next meeting. Just okay, and I was saying, and if, and if you don't do it by the next meeting, will you? Fair enough. Okay, okay. so uh, with that assurance uh, that we'll revisit this in January and do it one way or another, hmm. um, in in deference to um, William T. Trump, we trust that she has to be given more time uh, to compare and contra contrast. We're not meeting in December? No, no, well. But Brian, I agree with him. He wants a short meeting in December. Um, so I mean, I'd be, so I'd be happy to add that on. But okay. okay. So then January. Um, so with that, um, I would end up voting against the motion. It would be dead on. So do, if you if you want more candidate vote, otherwise. Uh, I just want to ask about the <coughs> one about background checks. Are we currently not clear on what we're doing because there's two policies? I'm running on it in a new policy. Do the background checks? Yep. Yeah. So I'm trying, I'm sorry, because I'm just trying to understand. Um, you're a voting member of the SU board and voted to approve these, mm -hmm. but won't vote to rescind ours, or are you, is that what you, you won't, or you just, or you want to? I'm just trying to clarify. Okay, what, what I'm thinking is, is 
pay deference to my colleague okay. um, that she wants. Because the, if there are subtle differences between the two um, and ones that we would like to keep, um, then we can, we can make that decision. Um, if they overlap completely, then we can, you know, then these are redundant. Um, I don't know if they do that. Um, I haven't done side by side comparison and we just ask to do that with now with the deadline. So. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. the position. I can still request the vote if you want. Either way, I'm happy to request the vote. Okay, I so didn't then. Make the motion. Anyway. Okay, so then motion stable until uh, okay. January. Okay. Any others that we need to do today? Uh, I that, oh, sorry. The, uh, I had it circled. Late hour. <laughs> um, I didn't know if you, Chris, you were the one that suggested the goal should come to the uh, the recommending the school quality goal be adopted by local boards at the SU. We put this on there. Yeah, I, I think we're going to put that off until January so we have a full complement. We can have a discussion about it. You know, I, I don't anticipate that there's can be a, a much objection to it, but I think it's going to roll off into a general. Okay. With that, do you have did you any other business? Matthew had his hand up. Well, that's why I'm here. Oh, you did. Uh, speak to that particular thing, but Matthew, if you want to take one until next time, I'll come back next time. You've been here so for okay. every <laughs> year. You here for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I am that too. <laughs> So, we don't want to do that. We don't want to do it since he's. You know what? Matthew comes in. He's been to all of our meetings. Um, and I suspect even if we weren't going to do this, you'd be here. Um, yeah, maybe. I don't know. Because I'm, I'm going to say, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think the next meeting for. We may be overlapping meetings even on the next time Rummy has to meet. Mm -hmm. I mean. So can we hear gonna, it and then vote next time? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, just basically the SC board, I think anyone who was there would remember that we uh, adopted three kind of modest uh, goals, one of which was basically just to endorse the, um, the set of math goals that have been developed by the WCSU staff collectively mm -hmm. over the fall. The second was to request uh, comparable goals for literacy this school year. And then the third was simply to request uh, an analysis and reflection on the data produced in the goal setting process at the end of the year. So that's all we really did. Um, but we were trying to get the district boards to essentially ratify that so that it was a collective mm -hmm. you know, decision of the board as a whole. So that's it. Um, the Doty board did do that last night. I wasn't yeah. at the Berlin meeting on Monday. They did on Berlin. They, so the they did that. The board has adopted it. Mm -hmm. And so we'll take it up in January. Okay. Thanks. Thank Any you. other business come before the board before we adjourn? Uh, we did not approve the minutes. Was that intentional? Oh, it was unintentional. Um, so, and I um, need you to do board orders as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Do you have board orders? Oh, they're right here. Okay. Uh, you want to make a motion on the board orders? <coughs> I move to approve the board orders in the amount of $249,881,003. Second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, move that we approve the, the minutes uh, for our October 24, 2018 meeting. Any Comments on those meetings? On those minutes? No, I'll second the motion. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I move that we approve the minutes from our November 8, 2018 meeting. Second. Any comments? I, I had just wondered about uh, one clause in there, but I did not get a chance to watch the video, so I'm happy to support. Okay. Um, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, a motion to approve the minutes for December 6, 2018. I so move. Second. Um, any discussion? All in favor of approving the minutes for the December 6, 2018 meeting? 
Aye. 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 Okay. Is there a comment you may want in? I actually, I'm, I have a couple things. I'm not going to talk to uh, take space, space, but I'm going to submit my proposal for increased data collection on the school quality to minutes, as well as the material I found on the district management group. Um, is there someone who has been signed this? Uh, me, sorry. Okay. I want to Any other business? No. Thank you very much.